Yes, indeed. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of a action packed day two of the second annual Women in Politics and Policy Seminar. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this session because uh, of our uh, close alumna friend who's always been supportive of FIU and DC's work and, and, uh, and everything that, that we're trying to do here. So without further ado, I will turn it over to this morning's uh, student session leader, Chloe Little. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chloe Little. I'm a current Hamilton scholar with FIU uh, with an internship in the Hill, and I believe we have some other Hamilton scholars on the call today. Welcome. Um, today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Claudia Pagan Marchena. She is currently a policy advisor in the office of Congresswoman Acacia Cortez, where she oversees all matters related to the House Committee on Financial Services, drafts bills, and advises on policy related to banking, housing, Puerto Rico, and immigration. She previously worked in the US Senate before making the transition to the House of Representatives. A Miami native, she studied economics at Florida International University, where she graduated summa cum laude. She has been featured in articles discussing the need to diversify Capitol Hill and what a progressive economic agenda looks like. She believes Congress should look and act like the people it represents. Claudia enjoys cooking and food documentaries in her spare time. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, Claudia. Thank I would you. like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, go ahead. Um, I would like just to get to the elephant in the room. I was able to look over the article on Forbes where you were mentioned and featured addressing women of color staffers on the Hill in economic policy. Um, and I saw that the Congresswoman Acacia Cortez actually wrote a couple words in regarding to you being on her team and she said some very honorable things. Um, but I would like to know from your perspective, what is it like being able to be um, part of Congresswoman Acacia Cortez office and helping her with her pol political strategies? Yeah, um, well, first of all, it's really great to be here with you all. Um, I'm really really looking forward to your questions and just having a conversation. Um, and as for that question, I mean, when I first started in this role, it was a bit crazy. It was the beginning of the 116th Congress. Um, it was the second month that she was in office. Um, and I remember working with the team to just develop a legislative agenda and priorities for the office. And I think that at the beginning we knew and we all sensed um, just how you know how impactful her platform um, was um, but I think throughout the 116th we really saw so many things come about and the congresswoman using her platform so working for someone that is not only a working class Latina like me um, but that really deeply cares about economic justice um, and centering the plight of working people in this country is something that I feel very privileged and honored to do because it's something that I deeply believe in as well. Um, and so I've had the pleasure of working on so many different initiatives that I think align with the values and the objectives of the office that have not only taught me so much about policy, but that really show me what a legislative process that is inclusive and intentional can look like. Um, I've also had the incredible privilege of working with some very brilliant folks um, that are thinking about issues in a different way and that are trying to, um, you know, do this in what we call this inside outside strategy, right? Centering um, the calls and the policy platforms that really help folks, whether it's you know, direct payments throughout the pandemic for folks that really need it or rent and uh, rent and mortgage cancellation. Um, I think it's been an incredible honor to be part of a team that's really working on these kinds of issues, but also it's not just our office, right? There are so many other voices that have come into the Congress, Representative Bush, Representative Bowman, other folks that are also doing this really good work. And so being part of a team that is not only doing this work, but is doing it in tandem with other offices feels like an incredible opportunity, but also I, I feel very fortunate to be here. So um, 
yeah, I think <laughs> that would be my response to that. But um, if you, I was, I was before you guys all came into the call, I was telling Chloe when and if we go back to in person in the office, feel free to come by. Um, I think it would be great to show you guys around. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that open invitation. <laughs> um, so Claudia, I would like to know why did you decide to major in economics while you were at FIU? And how has your background in this particular area um, influenced your career in public policy so far? Yeah, so, wow, taking me back. I remember I had just graduated high school and I was like, what is my major going to be? And I chose economics. Um, it wasn't like there was a very deep thought process. Um, somewhere I had heard that economics majors placed um, very high on the LSAT. And at the time I was very, you know, like, I wanted to go to law school. I thought that that's what my path was going to be. And I also happened to be really good at math. So it just felt like a natural kind of um, decision. But um, little did I know that it was actually going to be really helpful for what I was going to end up doing. Um, economics really set me up for the, poli the kind of policy work that I do now, for example, like uh, Chloe mentioned, I handle the financial services committee for the Congresswoman. And um, one thing that happens in financial services is that we have jurisdiction over all of the banking system and um, the Federal Reserve Chair comes routinely to testify before Congress. And so I remember in my classes learning about the FOMC at the Federal Reserve and how interest rates are set. Um, and that has actually been helpful, having that background and understanding those concepts in my day-to-day -day work and how I advise the Congresswoman. There was this really incredible um, exchange that she had last year with Chair Powell on the Federal Reserve about this issue of the Phillips curve um, and the Fed's dual uh, mandate, right, to adjust interest rates and also do full employment. And out of that exchange came a whole new um, Federal Reserve monetary policy framework that is now trying to center full employment, which has been um, an, organi an organizing call for so many grassroots movements because the Federal Reserve has such a hand in how um, the labor, the conditions of the labor market. Um, and so, yeah, economics really set me up to be able to do the kind of work that I do now. Um, that said, I don't think that you need this background to do this policy. I think a lot of people come into these, um, uh, like when you're thinking about what kind of policy you wanna pursue on the Hill, you'll be surprised that so many staffers actually start doing policy um, in an area that they don't have a background in. And I know a lot of my colleagues that also work for other members of the committee didn't necessarily have the same background that I did in economics and are still staffing the Congress member on that committee. So if you're thinking about policy, um, just because you don't think that you have the right background right now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can segue into policy. One thing that you'll learn about the Hill is that um, specifically on the House side, formal training for a lot of these policy areas is not something that a lot of folks have. You kind of learn on the job. Um, and you have a lot of support from career staff and committee staff. Um, so yeah, I would say that for my background, it's been very helpful, but you don't always need that background. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you for that. You know, yesterday being International Women's Day, um, I just think now studying economics is one of the most uh, powerful fields that, you know, I think young women can go into. And there was this staggering uh, statistic in the Forbes article that you were written up on. Um, I believe they mentioned that one out of every 400 economists with the Federal Reserve it happens to be a black woman. So I, I would wonder how that would pertain to just women in general um, serving as economic, economic policy advisors for our reserve system. Yeah, so I think that's an excellent point. And Another thing that is before the committee and that you know a lot of Democrats are working on is this issue of diversifying the Federal Reserve and diversifying just different 
um, areas across the financial services industry, um, whether that means more gender diversity or more race diversity. Um, it's definitely something that's very important sometimes when we think through issues, we think through, we all have our biases when we come to a place. And so it's definitely very important to give folks um, that represent certain communities a seat at the table when making decisions about um, our financial um, sector and the economy, right? We know that historically black unemployment, Latinx unemployment has been a lot higher than white unemployment. And I think that folks recognize that there isn't that there is a correlation between the folks that are making decisions, right, that are making these policy decisions um, and the gaps that you see in different communities because um, what you need to support certain communities, right, is different. And when you don't have diversity, when you don't have folks at the table, when, you know, women are, are very underrepresented in, uh, underrepresented in econ PhDs everywhere, it's a problem. And so I think when you're thinking about policy being inclusive, you definitely need to diversify and invite more folks to the table. The, uh, ch under Chairwoman Waters' leadership, the Financial Services Committee has actually created a diversity uh, subcommittee on diversity and inclusion in the financial services industry, which is something that we have not had before. Um, as you'll, I don't know if you guys saw or if you keep up with these kinds of news, but last year um, when the George Floyd protests were happening, there was a whole movement about um, banking while black and going into different bank branches and being discriminated against. And how do policymakers think through the responsibility and the roles that these private entities have to discourage that kind of um, behavior, right? And so that's something that's very front and center for us um, on the work that we're doing in the committee. And uh, definitely, if you guys are, any of you guys thinking about a career in economic policy, I would love to have an offline conversation because we definitely need more women, more women of color um, in this area. Yes, we do. And this idea of, you know, the gaps and bridging the gaps, um, that is definitely not a, a red or blue fight. That is a, a collective effort that we are working on as a nation. And I believe under our current administration, we, we see a lot more um, inclusive collaborative efforts. So I would like to ask, um, what, what are some bipartisan efforts that the Congresswoman and the team is proud of um, that have champ, like you've been able to champion over your two years so far, the past yeah. two years? So um, one of the things that we've actually worked on that I think a lot of Republicans recognize is very important is um, banning members of Congress from holding individual stocks. As you'll probably remember, um, last year there was this whole scandal with Senator, then Senator Loeffler um, buying and dumping stock um, while she was in these classified briefings around the pandemic. And so I think that when the Congresswoman originally spoke out against it, we had some very, un, you know, like uh, un, not the usual suspects um, approach us about collaborating with our office on this measure. And we've since introduced a, a bill that would ban individual members of, of Congress from holding uh, individual stock. And um, it's something that I think is very necessary because the folks that are decision makers that are policymakers should not stand um, to benefit from those decisions. They shouldn't have conflicts of interest that they're bringing to the table as they're thinking through these issues because that doesn't make them impartial. And their primary concern, right, should be the welfare of the public and of the American people. And when you have someone that might have a conflict of interest and that is legislating in a way that, you know, they're thinking about their own kind of uh, interests I don't think is good for the public. And so that's something that we were very proud to champion and that um, has been introduced and we got by bipartisan support on it. So yeah, um, but I would say that <clears throat> in general, um, when we think through what kinds of initiatives and what kinds of policies the office needs to be working on and where we need to be devoting our staff energy, 
we aren't necessarily thinking through what we'll receive bipartisan support. That's not our measure of success. Our measure of success is will this push the conversation in a way that helps working class people? Will this um, make a difference for the single mother, right, that is caring for four? Um, will this keep a roof over folks' head? Will this make sure that they can pay their rent? Because we have an affordable housing crisis in this country, right? And so I think that our measure of success is a little bit different in our philosophy on how we pursue different legislative topics, how we advocate um, for the needs of, folk, of the communities that we center is a little bit different. Um, and while, you know, we will always welcome a Republican support and bipartisan efforts. I think that are, you know, first and foremost, we're thinking through how we benefit or how we best advocate for working class people in this country. I love that. And then, you know, definitely, I believe transition can bring about uh, change, sometimes good sometimes bad, but I am curious to know, um, how is the transition, if at all, from the former Secretary of the uh, U.S. Treasury to now uh, Janet L. Yellen, um, how has this impacted the efforts on progressive legislation like the Public Banking Act? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been huge. When you think through who Steve Mnuchin was, so I should say this, um, when I was an undergrad student, a lot of um, my time was devoted to studying the causes of the Great Recession. The Great Recession, I think, is something that our generation, like, I, I, you know, I think we're all kind of somehow in the same age group. Um, and it's not something that I think we were all very conscious about as kids, right? It was like 2008. But um, <clears throat> I, in my opinion, is definitely one of the most tragic things in American history. Um, the Great Recession was a huge transfer of wealth from working in lower class families to upper class millionaires, billionaires, right? And I think that we still haven't seen the kind of recovery that is equitable. Um, and Steve Mnuchin was at the center of this. He was through various organizations that he led was one of the folks that was buying up distressed assets, these you know, housing, and was um, you know, profiting, profiting off of the misery of folks. There was people, you know, specifically Black and Latinx families still have not seen a recovery in their wealth, right? When you think through the years that it might have taken them to build the kind of equity that they eventually lost in the Great Recession, um, we, you know, it's, it's in my opinion, a huge tragedy. And when you have figures like that that are coming to policy with that lens, with that background, I think you will always have a centering of corporate interests, the banks, um, and not of the folks that actually matter, which are these communities and working class people that have been left behind. Um, and Janet Yellen, Secretary Yellen, is, I mean, it's night and day. Um, Secretary Yellen was one of the original people sounding the alarm on the Great Recession, watching um, what was happening in the housing market. Um, she has historically been a champion for women at the table um, and was a pioneer in her field in so many different ways. Um, she is someone that has advocated for things like automatic stabilizers that are very important. Um, when we're thinking through big, um, policy changes, right? Like, I don't know if you guys have followed, but like when Congress is considering all of these different packages to respond to the pandemic, like why are we here again? Why couldn't we just do this in one go, right? And extend or tie um, different programs, for example, unemployment or um, food stamp benefits to economic conditions. That's what automatic stabilizers are. We don't do that. And then we have these fiscal cliffs and then Congress needs to reconvene, reconvene, go through the politics all over again. Some That's why UI expired last year, you know, and so many different programs elapsed because we didn't tie it to automatic stabilizer. Janet Yellen is someone that believes in that, right? Whereas the previous administration did not. There was also, I mean, Steve Mnuchin handling the PPP program, which you know was a program that was established to help small businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, so many reports have come out about just how well connected 
um, wealthy uh, businesses were able to get PPP loans and smaller businesses, especially businesses of people of color were locked out of the program and then they went under, right? Um, and so it's night and day and I'm very happy that we won the Senate, the House and the White House. Um, but yeah, I think that Secretary Yellen will mean a lot to um, middle class, lower class folks in this country that really need the help. Um, the package that the, that the House is set to be voting on this week that President Biden will sign cuts child poverty in half. That is a huge expansion of the welfare state in a way that we have not seen in generations and I think is really meaningful. The fact that working class families stand to receive up to $500 additionally every month right, is a huge win. Um, and that's something that Secretary Yellen, the Biden administration have championed and that we're really happy to see. So, I mean, it's night and day. And um, I think there was something that you asked about the Public Banking Act. Well, to address the Public Banking Act, um, uh, Chairwoman Waters, Chair Brown, who chairs the Senate uh, Banking Committee and Chair Yellen have all been, um, supportive of postal banking, which postal banking is a form of public banking. And so we expect that um, throughout this Congress, we will see um, robust efforts to try and pull off some form of public banking. I definitely look forward to seeing um, these efforts move forward. I would like to give um, some of our other guests a chance to ask some questions. Uh, Sandra, I believe you had your hand raised. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this um, really great conversation. Um, I just wanted to know, um, based on your work in with doing with uh, um, with Ocasio Cortez, a Congresswoman, I was wondering how do you decide on which policies to advocate to ensure that you're improving economic justice for working class, racial, and ethnic minorities? Like, what's the process for that? What are how do you prioritize? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think so that that is something that we have thought a lot about internally. There are so many issues that need attention. There are so many things, right, that like need a champion, um, but we can't do it all. And we also recognize that there are so many other folks that have come to Congress that, um, you know, can take up that mantle. And so one way that we think through how we prioritize issues is thinking back through the needs of our district. Um, the Congresswoman represents parts of Queens and the Bronx. Both are very um, expensive um, housing markets. So housing specifically is a really big issue for our office. Um, when the pandemic started, one of the things that the Congresswoman routinely advocated for was the cancellation of rent and mortgage payments. Um, it kind of goes back to this idea that if you allow folks, if you don't give folks the support that they need, they're going to eventually be evicted and it's going to exacerbate um, the entire pandemic, right? Because then families will have to double up and then if someone has it in that household, they can transmit it. And you just don't want this kind of outcome. And also rent is piling up and folks are laid off and they don't have income streams. You, you really need to provide the kind of support that will um, keep them housed. Um, and so housing specifically is huge for us. Economic justice is huge for us. It was part of her original platform when she was running. Um, and it, you know, and how we think through that is we've released so many different bills, but the public banking act, since it's already, you know, been mentioned, provides a public option to the for-profit um, private banking industry in this country that has left behind so many communities, right? There are so, entire swaths of the population that are either underbanked or unbanked altogether, right? And access to capital, access to financial services is one way of creating wealth in this country, right? If you can't go to a bank and get a loan to buy a home, right? And 
owning a home is one of the primary wealth creators in this country, how are you supposed to build wealth, right? And so um, housing, economic justice, immigration is also a huge priority for us because of the district that we represent. Queens is the most diverse um, place in this entire country. Um, and so we represent so many different folks. And so one way that we think through how we prioritize in just the sea of issues that need um, advocacy is thinking through the direct needs of our constituents. And that's always been kind of a guiding, um, uh, just the North Star for us and how we think through how we engage because we also do have limited staff capacity and the Congresswoman is only one person. Um, so I would say that that's one major way of us thinking through issues. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a, it's it's like yeah, it's so grandiose, but trying to narrow down and understand what actually is prioritized, it's good to think through. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, Sandra. Okay, I believe Hannah had her hand raised next. Hi, um, my name is Hannah, and I'm a senior majoring in psychology. Um, so my question was, you had talked about how you originally planned on going to law school. So I just wanted to ask you more about the path that led you to work um, with the Congresswoman. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I, I realize I haven't touched on this. Um, so as an undergrad, well, first I did the Washington Center. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the Washington Center, right? The state of Florida provides support um, for folks to come up to DC. And that was my first internship ever here in DC and afterwards, I mean, I was hooked. I knew that I wanted to do public policy. And so it was really my focus to get back to DC. And so I did that, I think summer 2017 and that entire fall semester, I applied to every and any program I could find that would bring me back to DC. And I ended, landing, I ended up landing a couple of things, one of them being CHCI, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, which I would really recommend to you guys. Um, and so, I mean, it was a no brainer. I accepted the offer, came and did CHCI. And CHCI, for those of you that are not familiar, it's basically an organization that provides housing, a monthly stipend and transportation stipend for you to come to DC and do an internship and they help place you in different offices on the Hill. Um, and so I did that. And then um, I was really fortunate that the office that I was working in at the time, which was another office, not this one, um, hired me um, at the end of the internship. So I was not done with my undergrad, but they were very understanding and accommodating. And I finished online and I started working. And when, um, and then after that, that specific office, um, I, you know, kind of, I would say that coming to DC was also my own kind of, it was also a process of finding myself of what I believed in, what my political inc inclinations were and what I wanted to devote my energy and just talents to advocating for. And that office was not necessarily a great fit um, and so I started this process of um, looking for different opportunities that more closely aligned to where I was personally. And then I was very fortunate that I had a mentor um, that um, basically flagged my application materials for this office. And then they reached out and um, started the interview process. And then long story short, I got the job. That underscores two things. One is just kind of knowing yourself. Um, and, you know, I think that like all of us will go through this process where like we, you find, you learn a little bit more about yourself, what interests you, what fires you up, what you want to be doing. And second, the need to have really great mentorship when you have people that will advocate on your behalf, that will go to bat for you, that will um, take time to review your thousand and one applications and reach out to folks on your behalf and just talk about your great work, I think is really important. I definitely would not be here had it not been for the help that I got from so many amazing people along the way. So um, that's basically how I got here. And um, I don't foresee myself leaving anytime soon, but um, I think in the future, I know that I, I want to remain in this space in this policy space 
Um, and I'm, I, I haven't closed the door completely on law school, but I think I really enjoy the work that I do now. Um, and I thought, right, that like to do this kind of work, you would be best served by a JD. It turns out you don't really need one. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I thought through that decision. Like I said, it's not completely closed, but um, I think for the time being, I'm going to remain in econ policy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, Hannah. That is a powerful testament to the power in networking and mentorship. And I'm definitely taking notes on that. Um, I believe Maureen had a question for you as well. Hi, Claudia. First, I'd like to thank you for using your expertise to help working class families. And my question for you is, if you were the Secretary of the Treasury, which I can see happening someday, which policies and programs would you implement on day one? That is a great question. Um, so I think it would definitely have to be a wealth tax. And I, I think part of this, so I kind of alluded to it in the beginning, but I think a bit about my background, um, I, um, my mother came from Nicaragua. I was raised by a single mother. And when I first, I think when I first started having my own political awakening, one of the things that really struck me was just how if government policy had been different, how different my life could have been and how folks like my mother um, could have a different outcome in life, right? Or my brothers, right? Just families like mine. And when you think through how just wide the, the um, wealth inequality in this country is, I mean, for me, it was really one of the things that like triggered my political awakening. And um, there are so many different policies, whether it's student loan cancellation or, you know, just expanding social services for folks that need it or as we think through universal basic income or we're thinking through, right, like the expansion of certain tax credits for families, like all of those things can be financed if we had the political will to tax the rich. Um, there have been so many reports about just folks like Jeff Bezos and you know, all these other billionaires making a killing off of the pandemic, right? When so many families were hurting, so many families were facing eviction or didn't know how they were going to put food on the table or are now facing these insane healthcare costs because they got sick and needed care and they didn't have healthcare, right? There are so many things that we could be doing if we just had the political will to tell people to pay their fair share in taxes. And, um, you know, there was... Um, the Biden administration has been thinking about a number of initiatives. And when the wealth tax has come up, Secretary Yellen has talked th about just the number of implementation issues that would arise because of a wealth tax. And I think that there are some concerns there that I think um, are merited and should be explored a bit further. But that said, it is something that is possible and is something that um, <laughs> would mean a lot to a lot of folks when you think about just how insidious poverty is and how it affects absolutely everything in someone's life. They're, you know, the kinds of op employment opportunities that they're going to have, the schools that they go to, health disparities, like everything. It affects absolutely everything. And if we just had the political will to implement these kinds of programs, poor people in this country would have very different outcomes in life. Um, and if you think through just the basic needs that people have, right, I don't think that people often say like, oh, um, no one that works 40 hours a week should be living in poverty. And yes, I do agree with that statement, but I would take that statement further and just say, no one should be living in poverty, right, independent of whether you have a job or not. And um, programs like these, thinking through a wealth tax, um, could take us a long way in, um, in solving so many issues in this country. So yeah, that wealth tax would be my first policy. 
Uh, I think that's a great policy and I'm a, histor I'm a historian. So this, it seems to me that this is like the Gilded Age part two and the response to the Gilded Age was reform and OAC is a reformer and we do need plenty of reform in this country. So thanks for being on you know, the right team. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And I think to that point, um, <clears throat> when you think about the austerity politics that have dominated the political conversation for a long time, and what I mean by that is just, how are we going to pay for it? It's going to balloon the deficit. We can't do this because blah, 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 blah. I think that there have been so many people who have challenged those um, premises and those assumptions. And I think with the the new package that the president is slated to sign, you see a very uh, marked departure from the austerity politics. And so I think um, this administration really has a once in a generation lifetime to do really good for the public. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing just the reform age that we're stepping into. Mm -hmm. I believe um, Biden's administration is comparable to FDRs or in the midst of a crisis and we have to work together and have great policies to pull us out. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you. I think everyone here cannot wait until you're Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Claudia, or part on the, the Board of Governors for the Reserve. That'd be great too. <laughs> um, I believe Ashley has her hand raised next. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, my name is Ashley. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I guess coming at this as someone who has interned for a district office, I was hoping you could sort of um, tell us how you can communicate with constituents after you said that Queens is such a diverse place, um, especially with those that don't speak English. And I don't mean just the Spanish speakers because that's so much more common. Um, um, and just more or less common um, languages, how do you reach out to them and ensure our office is here to help, basically? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> when the Congresswoman um, took office, I think one of the things that she was very committed to, um, in addition to paying folks a living wage, was diversity. And so I think our team um, is about 80 percent uh, people of color, which is um, incredible. And um, if you see like diversity statistics, statistics across the House and Senate, you'll see that that's not the norm um, and that this can still be a very uh, white institution. Um, and so part of what comes with that is having folks that come from all walks of life that speak very different languages. We have folks in the office that speak Mandarin, speak Bengali, speak Spanish. Um, I mean, yeah, there's, um, I'm trying to think through what else, but if there's a language that we don't speak, we have um, part of our budget goes to translating services. Um, and this includes American Sign Language as well and access for folks with disabilities, right? Because that's often a community that is ignored. Um, and so we're very intentional about anytime we do a public facing event that involves constituents, we have translators, um, folks that can do sign language. Um, when we have folks that are handling phones, we also make sure that you know they can speak kind of the languages that most often approach the office. Um, and if not, we also have translators that can speak to them. Um, so we're very intentional about you know being able to service our constituents and that like the folks that work in this office are representative of the district and i think that we have done a really good job if i can say that um that uh, in our office about that so yeah i think any any representative that represents a very diverse district or that doesn't right should be very intentional about like just providing opportunity to folks from all walks of life um of, you know gender diversity, race diversity, sexual orientation diversity, all kinds of it, right? Um, economic diversity, right? Because I think it's also important to think through um, giving opportunities to folks that come from working class backgrounds that don't traditionally make it very far in this institution. So um, we've been very conscious and intentional about that in our hiring decisions. 
Well, thank you. I did not know that you could actually get um, translation services. Never came up when I was in an office. So <laughs> just learned something today. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Wow, Ashley, I'm really glad you asked that question. That is a, a powerful um, resource to know of. And yeah, that should definitely have been communicated to you while you were there. Um, I believe Jennifer had a question next. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer. Um, I had a question on um, the fact that you the, you were able to get a DC because you got paid internships. And that's one of the things I'm struggling with in the pandemic. There's not a lot of resources or ways to get a DC, uh, but there's a couple of ways to get housing and paid internships. But um, I got an internship with the State Department last summer, but as we all know, they're unpaid. So I wanted to know the, how paid internships lead to inclusiveness. Yeah, that's also a really great question. Um, so when you think about like, the kinds of folks that are able to come to DC and do an unpaid internship, right, are probably the kinds of folks that like their parents can support them, can pay for housing for months on end, can provide them, right, just money for living expenses. That's not true of so many different students, right? Like my parents definitely could not contribute anything to any of the internships that I did. And had it not been for organizations like CHCI or the fact that the state of Florida and FIU subsidized the Washington Center, I could have never come, right? And I think that that would have closed the door on me and on so many other folks that just can't afford to come to a very high cost city like Washington DC and not receive any sort of income for months on end. And so um, recently, well, not recently, for a number of years, organizations like Pay Our Interns had been, have been advocating for paid internships specifically because the pipeline looks very different when you provide folks the kinds of support that they need to come take advantage of these opportunities. Um, otherwise, you close the door on them. And so paying interns is very important. And actually, the House of Representatives, for the first time last Congress, um, provided an allocation of several thousand dollars for offices to be able to pay internships because just going back a few years, um, actually, when I was managing the intern program for my former office, there was, we didn't grant our interns any kind of income. And of course, our incoming classes looked a certain way and they came from certain backgrounds and they went to certain elite schools, right? And um, that was just the pool that we got of applicants because you know, there was just no support that Senate and House offices were providing to students wanting to take advantage of these opportunities. And so I think the more that that changes, the more that that is challenged, right? Because people say like, well, they're getting all of this great experience that is going to like affect their earnings potential down the line is absolute BS, sorry for the language, right? Like you need to provide folks support because otherwise your pool of candidates of applicants is going to look very different. Um, and you see that when you walk through the halls of Congress, you see who, what Congress looks like currently. And I think the more that you, that people like challenge that and that we move away from that sort of system, the more you will see diverse applicants coming to Congress and taking advantage of these opportunities. So. Um, it's not to discourage you like my first internship the Washington Center, like I said, was subsidized, but like I did not receive um, payment from that internship. And so as an undergrad student, I had to save all of my refund checks, save a lot of what I made in my part time job to be able to survive that summer because what I was given was housing, which was a huge help. Um, but it, you know, it's it's an uphill battle for folks. And so you do need to provide support and, um, you know, organizations have been doing the work, but I'm with you that you need, in order to diversify, you need to provide support. And that looks like housing, that looks like transportation subsidies, that looks like a stipend, all of it, right? So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, the State Department I had was virtual. So I had to 
work at the same time because it was unpaid and it was kind of like a hassle because I had classes, I had work and I had the internship. So it was a lot of, of workload for me and it was unpaid. And I was getting the experience and I was like, oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> and thank yeah. you. It's definitely much more difficult, but I'm glad you were able to take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, and I would definitely like to um, mention I'm currently in a congressional internship and it would not have been possible if it wasn't for FIU and DC. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you are on the mailing list, mailing list for the newsletters. Um, they're constantly sending paid opportunities and they will work with you regardless if you're interested in becoming a Hamilton scholar. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely, I believe FIU is aware of these barriers and they are helping us enter these places and uh, positions of um, influence through policy, you know, um, I would love to share more information about my experience on that. And I'm, I know Eric and Carlos would love to aid you in that as well. I believe Brittany has had her hand raised and would like to ask a question. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Brittany. I'm a junior double majoring in linguistics and policy. And in your time in this office, on the local, state, and federal level, have you noticed any disparities or like imbalance in regards to budgeting? And if so, like what are they? And how are your office or how is your office trying to advocate for better re reallocation of money? Yeah, I mean, that is a policy question that we have been grappling with since all of last year, really. So when the pandemic first started, states, municipalities were facing the kinds of budgetary shortfalls that lead to um, them laying off workers, um, cutting public services, public transit systems specifically were very hard hit by this. Um, in New York, the MTA um, was had to like cut service um, for the first time in I think 100 years because of the of, the budgetary constraints that they were facing. And so one of the first steps that was taken to just stabilize the municipal bond market, which is where states and localities go to kind of get um, capital was the Federal Reserve set up the municipal liquidity facility. And there were a host of issues with the MLF um, and that you know the borrowing terms were very stringent. And so a lot of different places were not able to take um, advantage of the money that was provided through the CARES Act for this lending facility. And obviously, um, right now, I believe states are facing like a 1.3 million uh, shortage in jobs. Um, and so the $350 billion that is allocated through the American Rescue Plan will definitely be a lifeline to so many of these places that had to lay off um, workers or cut back on public services. Um, and Honestly, when you think through back to the Great Recession, right, because like I think there were so many lessons for policymakers and lawmakers in the Great Recession that you're seeing play out now, because one of the criticisms against the Obama administration was just how little um, their stimulus package did in addressing the need and how because of that the recovery was inequitable and it was prolonged and so in what the Biden administration has done with the American Rescue Plan, they have gone large, big. Um, and, you know, it's gotten praise from like, from people from the Chamber of Commerce all the way to Bernie Sanders, right? Like, um, but I think there was a real recognition that like, if we don't provide the kinds of supports that states and localities need, it's going to prolong the economic hardship um, and it's going to hurt a lot of different communities. Um, for example, back in 2008, when states were going through all of this, one of the things that they had to cut back on was helping students. Um, and they had to raise tuition fees for public universities. And because of that, right, that, contri that directly contributed to the student loan crisis that we see now because tuition rates went up, there was you know, smaller support for students and people had to take on a lot more debt in order to go to school. Um, and so I think that there's a real recognition that you had to go big um, and help states because um, they're a major employer and they also service so many different 
populations that are vulnerable in the form of public services that they grant. So yeah, does that answer the question? Sorry, I went in a lot of different directions there. Oh no, it really does. Like, it was just a general question. I wanted to know your opinion on it. So thank you. Thank you. I have a question. This is Carlos Becerra. Yes, Carlos. And since this uh, Zoom full of uh, women and Carlos and Eric are family now, do you remember the time that you did not listen to Carlos Becerra's advice? <laughs> is this a trick question? <laughs> no, because I do. Uh... <laughs> and you are all the better for it. So here's- what was that? Okay, I know where you're going, what? go ahead. Where, where am I going, where am I going? I think we were at um, the inauguration party for DMP and I was talking about wanting to work for a progressive and you mm -hmm. were like, no, no, hang on to where you are right now. And I was like, so, yeah. The, uh, the women can uh, backtrack on your bio and see where you were working before. But yes, at that meeting, I was like, you know, but Claudia, you're, you're working in the office now. You've got a, you've got a role there. And, and this person, we won't name the name uh, on the Zoom, but just look at her bio, you know, was, has just announced running for president. And this would be, I know it's not, it's not, you know, ticking at your heart, um, you know, because, you know, you have bigger, bolder policy visions and it, it's just not a matching, but, you know, maybe there's going to be an opportunity to meet a lot of national other players and a presidential campaign, you know, obviously that bleeds into the, and you're like, no, 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 no. And sure enough, you did not listen to my advice and look at you now because you're all the better for it. And you ended up in, I would say, what is just the right spot in uh, at the center of all the action when you're looking at progressive issues on the House side, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, it's been a wild ride, honestly. But um, I guess listen to your instincts. Um, and I'm definitely a lot happier um, being able to work on these issues from the lens that I approach them from. And I think that that's a flexibility that's been afforded to me because of the office that I work in. Um, and that, you know, there are so many other folks here that like have these same political inclinations, but like their member, whoever they work for is just not there. And so their jobs look a lot different. And so I feel very fortunate to be able to work on policy um, and go big and be, you know, unapologetic in how we advocate and approach issues. So. Yeah, listen to your instincts. It's okay not to listen to Carlos. <laughs> I'm actually really happy that um, Carlos was here for you to share that with us because one of my favorite uh, quotes, I'm gonna mess it up, that I've heard from Congresswoman Cortez is that being a light doesn't necessarily mean being silent. And I, I love Claudia that you had, you know, not only your expertise to your education and your passions, but you were able to follow your inner, inner voice of where you wanted to be and how it's paid off. So that's, that's incredible. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely pursue what you know is right for you. So, yeah. Well, I think that was a, uh, uh, a great hour with Claudia as always. And um, I mean, what a great job moderating to Chloe. So let's uh, give Chloe props for leading that session and make sure, making sure everyone who uh, uh, wanted to ask a question had an opportunity to do so. Thank you, Chloe. And uh, thank you, Claudia, for, for spending your morning with us and for you know, always being uh, willing to lift up the next generation um, of Claudia so that when you are Secretary of the Treasury, uh, one of these amazing women could be where you are now along the way. And I put in links to paid TWC internships and CHEI in the chat so that if anyone's looking to follow your direct path, uh, it is uh, laid out right there in front of them. Claudia, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for having me and all of your really phenomenal questions. If I can be of service um, to any of you, Eric has my information. Always happy to chat with um, FIU students. So thanks again for having me. Really enjoyed this hour um, and reach out if I can be of help. Thanks, Claudia. Um, 
really without further ado, as you all, as you all know, our whole morning is uh, back to back to back. So you should have your water, coffee, anything you need nearby. And uh, uh, we're gonna keep on uh, rolling uh, with our next guest, who's also a dear friend of uh, FIU and DC and of Carlos and, uh, and, and myself. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Ashley, uh, who is going to be introducing her and leading this session. Awesome. Hi, um, I'm Ashley, a graduate student in global affairs here at FIU um, and current intern with the Economic Development Administration working with the America's Competitiveness Exchange Program. Um, so happy to welcome you here, Dr. Uh, Munoz Pobacian, um, just to get started with your bio. Um, so Dr. Munoz Pobacian is a director of the Department of Social Inclusion at the Organization of American States. For more than 15 years, she has led missions, programs, and projects, and conducted research on issues of democracy and elections, and equity and social inclusion, among others. At the Department of, so of Social Inclusion, Dr. Munoz Pogosian leads work on the inclusion of populations in vulnerable situations and on the promotion of the full exercise of their human rights. Among her responsibilities, she directs work on migration and refugees in support of the OES Secretary General and Member States. She also holds a PhD in political science from Florida International University, go FIU, and a master's degree in international relations from the University of South Florida. She is the author of various academic publications and opinion columns on issues of democracy, human rights, migration and refugees, gender equity and social inclusion, among other topics. That was a mouthful, but it's a testament to your career <laughs> as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ashley, for the kind introduction, and, and it's a very good morning to all of you. All of you, and, and happy International Women's Day, even though it's a day after, but we're going to take the whole month of March to commemorate. And of course, Carlos, siempre un gusto verte, big hug to you, and Eric, who I am connecting with for the first time via virtually, because we had met in the past in some of the functions FIU in DC had had in the past. Uh, great, great to connect and, and thank you so much for including me in the program that you have developed for FIU students in DC this week. Um, happy to be here, Ashley. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you here. Um, I believe you mentioned you had a presentation. If not, we can go into the questions if you don't. Actually, no, I, I, let's, you know, I, I went with Eric's recommendation of just you know, having the Q&A conversation type of approach. Okay, then. Um, so I guess we should start with an introduction with the OAS and your role in there. Um, so sure. what is the role of the OAS within DC's diplomatic ecosystem? And what are the goals of the Department of Social Inclusion? Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, um, again, you did mention I am a graduate of FIU. I did my PhD in political science there. I work with Dr. Gamarra, Eduardo Gamarra. I'm not sure if you are all familiar with him, but uh, he's still a mentor for me. And uh, after I complete, actually during uh, the time I was completing my PhD, I applied for an internship at the OAS, the Organization of American States, and was selected. And since then I ended up doing my PhD remotely, the last part meaning comms and in my dissertation and, and started my career at the OAS. I knew of the OAS from the classes that I took on in the undergraduate and, and as well as um, graduate school. But you know, one thing is to kind of understand the history of a multilateral institution and another very different to actually work on, you know, in the institution and understand the dynamics and the actually the areas of influence and the capacity to to influence agendas that are that are dear to you, what I mean that you are committed with or that are dear to you. Uh, the OAS is an intergovernmental body, same as the UN, but of course for the Western Hemisphere, and it does work in based in four pillars: democracy, human rights, security, and integral development. There's a series of. Uh, um, commitments and mandates associated with these four pillars. And our job on the side of the General Secretariat is to help member states implement those commitments. Along, by the way, along with those commitments that are enshrined in the charter of the OAS and as well as other resolutions, 
there's also a series of conventions based, you know, human rights conventions uh, that, in, that also ensure that citizens of the Americas can have access to their rights in all realms, civil and political, as well as economic, social, cultural, and the latest discussion on environmental rights, which is also part of the agenda of the OAS. So we do this working with governments, be connecting to the ecosystem of other actors that are uh, working in these four pillars that includes academia, philanthropic sector, private sector, uh, civil society organizations, other social actors that may not be articulated formally in civil society organizations. And we move the agendas uh, that, are, that, that are really mandates that have been given by the member states to us. My area of expertise, and we can talk a little bit more about how I started at the OAS, initially was in political affairs and democracy development. And, and it was very, or let's just say directly connected to what I had done at FIU. But starting in 2005, I was given the opportunity to put together the Department of Social Inclusion from scratch. There was no previous work done on social inclusion as a, as a um, paraguas, no? as the, the big uh, umbrella uh, to approach the, social, the human rights agenda at the OAS. Um, uh, interesting that five years later, it is the issue at the OAS. I mean, social inclusion is something everyone is talking about. Uh, donors are interested in supporting and the agendas that fall within this mandate are very hot on the political conversation at the, at the, at the, in the region, at the OAS, but also in the region. And in the Department of Social Inclusion, again, I was given the, the mandate to put it together. I only had an executive order that said, these are your functions and uh, these are the mandates that you need to you know, deliver on. And I had to put together the mission, vision, the narrative, the objectives, recruit people, and I had no money, so I had to go to other departments to kind of like snatch the, the best talent from other areas. <laughs> uh, I found that interesting because uh, I was kind of like almost mid-career and to give, be given this chance to, to do this at, at that point in my career, very few people have that privilege. So I was super excited, but it has been a lot of work. At Social Inclusion, we work in three strategic lines of work. Uh, poverty reduction and economic, social, and cultural rights, a second area of work on issues of the inclusion of vulnerable uh, of groups in situations of vulnerability. And we are trying to transform the narrative so that we don't refer to these groups as vulnerable groups per se, but groups that happen to be in a situation of vulnerability with the understanding that if we address whatever caused that, that vulnerability, we can change, transform the reality and, and have and, and for them to be able to access their rights. And a third line of work that, as I said, is very, it's a very hot uh, issue is the issue of migration, migration and forced, forced displacement. We have a mandate of work on refugees, migrants, and, and sort of monitor at least three of the largest displacement crises that we're seeing in the region, the Venezuelan uh, migratory crisis, you know, over 5 million people have been displaced in the last, um, let's say three, four years. The displacement, of course, of people from the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador towards the US. And since the April 2019 crisis in Nicaragua, the displacement of Nicaraguans to mostly to Costa Rica. 80%, 80 some percent of those Nicaraguans displaced have been settled in, in Costa Rica. This puts pressures in you know, these countries that are very small. So we follow up on all of it. Uh, and, and actually I, I'm very, I feel very privileged to be working in this agenda uh, in this moment of the, in, at least in the region. No? It's, it's, these are relevant topics for the region. Well, yeah, thank you. It, it certainly gives us a good introduction of your role at the OES. And wow, to have get, been given the opportunity to just start your own department <laughs> on such little orders and then grow it into this big and impactful thing. Um, so I guess as a follow up, yesterday we were actually speaking about diversity and inclusion in the American government. So could you tell us about you know your career analyzing and advocating for 
um, diversity and inclusion in democratic institutions abroad and the trends and progress you're seeing in the countries that you work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, of course, again, it, this has become the issue and, and it's central to this Biden administration and it's central to the conversations that happen at the OES. Initially at the OES, I, I mentioned I was doing something directly related to um, what I did at FIU. My, my PhD dissertation with Dr. Gamarra was on issues of electro, was on electoral systems and, and really how electoral, this is very hardcore political science, how electoral systems impacted the relationship between presidents and Congress, Congresses. So I, I go to the OES, do an internship, and I end up in the election observation department. So I've been, you know, for the first 13 years of my career at the OES, I was leading election observation missions. I was, uh, you know, providing cooperation to countries on this issue. So my approach to the diversity and inclusion component of or, or the agenda, let's say, uh, from the standpoint of political affairs and democracy development was first by helping the OES standardize their questionnaires and their metric, metricas, you know, matrices to assess democratic elections throughout the Americas and generate a, a one guideline that could be applied to all countries. And as, associated with that, I also worked on developing method, specific methodologies. The first one was to assess how women and men participate in elections as voters, as candidates, as uh, election, election administrators, the ones that are sitting down administering the election in the um, electoral management bodies. I mean, trying to see if there is a difference in the way that they participate. And, and this became really seminal for the work of the OES, still referred. I still, it's been, I don't know, maybe 12 years since I, I wrote that methodology and I still get invitations to explain it. And, and so it's still very relevant. And it was a long, long time ago, I mean, 10 years. And then the second one that I uh, started to develop was how to evaluate uh, the participation of Afro descendants and indigenous peoples in elections of the Americas. Also with that same very structured uh, uh, analysis of, you know, as voters, as candidates, as administrators, as members of electoral management bodies. And, and this uh, again was also an interesting contribution to the way that the OES had done elections. And of course now, <clears throat> in the social inclusion department in this second line of work that I mentioned on the inclusion of vulnerable groups. Uh, we do everything, uh, um, rights of Afro-descendants, indigenous persons with disabilities, LGBTI people, uh, youth, also we do a lot of work on youth <clears throat> and access to their rights. And, uh, and of course, because I took one class one time at USF, the gender issue is cross-cutting, is something that I do in anything, really. In all the work I do, I always try to incorporate, incorporate a gender perspective. Well, this is the Women in Politics and Policy fly-in, so I would say I have to ask oh, okay. about women. <laughs> um, so how, what is the difference or what trends have you noticed between men and women participating in civil society, um, especially in the indigenous population as well, because they're usually you know, not included, uh, they're in marginalized and they don't necessarily, you know, um, integrate into our modern society, so to speak. Um, could you explain more about that? Yeah. In the case of civil society organizations in general, because it's a different dynamic, indigenous communities versus civil society organizations. When it comes to organizations, what we see is a replica of the same pyramidal structure where you have a lot of women doing the work in civil society organizations, the, the, the on the ground community type of connection. And then when you go towards the leadership of these organizations is mostly men. I, I tell you because I am Venezuelan American, I'm very well connected with the humanitarian responses being given to Venezuela. And 60% of those who are actively involved in providing humanitarian support are women but they only are like 31% of the leadership of the civil society organizations. And this you see everywhere throughout the region. So, I mean, this you know, brings to mind all the more structural issues and stereotyping and values that we still need to address as, as countries. 
And then in the particular case of uh, indigenous communities, there is a, a very submissive role of women in dynamics that could be attributed to usos y costumbres. I, I don't know how to say that in English, like uh, customs and yeah, customs. Sort of indigenous customs. Um, and, and again, you know, but there's also very active indigenous women who are trying to approach it from within. And this is really the best way to, to transform it, not from outside, but from within, in my view. Wow, okay. Um, could you explain more about, you know, these vulnerable groups? Well, I know that you don't really want to explain, like, to refer to them as vulnerable, but these people in vulnerable situations, could you provide some examples and how you're trying to take them out of the situations? Yeah, well, uh, I, I kind of uh, mentioned the groups that we that are uh, subject to international protection. Uh, Afro-descendants is more, you know, millions. You, you would think that it's a small amount, but it's six, like over 60 million African uh, Afro-descendants in the region, of course, with some countries having more uh, of a um, peso población. I'm sorry, I'm thinking in Spanish because I just gave a, a presentation on this recently. Uh, the, the way they have in the census is greater in some countries like Brazil or, uh, you know, coastal regions like Costa Rica, Venezuela, Colombia, right? Um, so, but this is one group that we uh, always are, for instance, we have a, an inter-American network of public officials who developed, who, who, whose job is to develop public policies for Afro-descendant people. So, and, and what we generate is learning between them and mapping out the best uh, laws, the best policies that could be replicated in other countries. Not that you have to impose them, but so that there's a reference in terms of what's working in other countries. In the case of indigenous peoples, it's over 50 million people uh, of indigenous descent uh, who are in the region. And of course, Guatemala, Bolivia, having a greater representation of these groups in their, in their censuses. But you know, we, we do similar work. We have a declaration, Inter-American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that is a, a document of commitments, but uh, from the standpoint of the more practical approach to the use of this declaration, we take those commitments and have been mapping indicators to help countries monitor progress in the implementation of the documents. Um, we also work uh, on the issue of LGBTI rights. This is something new. The OAS in the past did not work on this uh, openly and, and proactively. We, we have our Secretary General, Luis Almagro, who came on board and gave us the mandate to work on this. And uh, um, there's always discussions, uh, political controversy within the OAS in terms of naming uh, all the groups that are subject to international protection. That's another conversation, but from the standpoint of the project, projects that we do, um, we are working actively on, uh, on, on issues of LGBTI rights and something, as I can give you an example of something that we're doing. We are working with the Clinton Foundation and the Open for Business Initiative on uh, helping uh, quantify the loss of not using LGBTI talent for uh, development. So it's very difficult, but in the end, we managed this. Is a, there's a big group of us advising the process through a survey and a series of other types of uh, research methods to try to quantify how much we don't earn when we don't include LGBTI talent in, their, in the development of our countries. And, and this is a, con a concrete example of what we're doing in that agenda. And then we, there's a, the, I think the, the one that's most, most developed is a people's with disabilities agenda at the regional level and at the OAS too. We uh, are technical secretariat to the committee that follows up on a convention that we have specifically on the issue of the elimination of discrimination against people with disabilities. So these are just some examples. <laughs> well, those are great examples and really mm -hmm. prevalent to the issues in society today. <laughs> um, so just, I guess to touch upon another um, group and a theme of our flying, the elderly. So COVID-19 mm -hmm. has made a lot of seniors isolate and have to interact with each other for, through 
technology. So how can we make sure that they can still participate as valued members of society, given that, you know, they might not be as technologically inclined or have that access to internet or devices as other generations or, yeah. Yeah, we also uh, have a mandate of work with uh, elderly people. There's actually a convention approved in 2015 on the rights of uh, adultos mayores. No, they, they call it older adults. It's really the translation. Um, we, at the beginning of the pandemic, must have been April of last year, we produced a, a guide. It, we called it the OAS. A ver si lo digo en inglés. A practical guide to develop respo inclusive responses to COVID-19 with a human rights perspective. I think something like that. I, I can give you, I'll text in the chat, the link to the English version of the guide. And what we did is we went group by group and, uh, and did a very quick assessment. It's like maybe three pages per group, uh, assessing how the COVID-19 was impacting them by April and then how we saw it could impact them. What are the key recommendations from a human rights and inclusive perspective to take in, for countries to take into consideration when developing responses to those challenges and then providing a list of resources of where to go to get more information on, on the design of these policies and also looking at implementation. And of course, elderly people was one of the groups um, uh, and it's many, there's many dimensions of how they have been affected as in any crisis, always the most vulnerable are the ones who suffer the most. Elderly people, I mean, you refer to issues of isolation and, you know, additional to the isolation, many of them already suffer, plus the social distancing, imagine that, and the access to technology, the fact that they're not um, uh, digi uh, literate digitally, I guess is the word. Uh, alfabetos digitales and um, and so you know you can refer I, I, I can refer the guys so you see some of the concrete recommendations but in the from the most practical standpoint it, it is an issue of education in my view no? and, and, and providing uh, elderly people with the tools to uh, understand how to operate in a in a virtual world because COVID-19 accelerated everything that we were all, we kind of we were transitioning toward the use of technologies. I mean, it happened super fast with the coming of COVID-19. I can tell you from my own mom. My mom teaches at USF, and she was doing uh, in-person teaching, and she had to like learn how to operate Zoom, how to post things on Google Classroom, how to and or the equivalent platform at USF. And uh, it was very hard for her. She suffered through it. At the same time, I said, you know, you have a, you take it as a privilege that you are going to be able to learn all these things. And in the end, she she did. But not everyone has that opportunity to be able to get training from people in the family or people uh, wherever they work to to, pro, to 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 adapt to this new reality. And really, it is the new reality. I believe. I think this came to stay. We are going to do a lot of stuff this way from now on. Okay, I guess just a few, I'd like to pivot to something a little bit more current. Um, and you mentioned that you are from Venezuela. So of course the Biden administration has just granted PPS to Venezuelans. Yes. I'd like to know more about your opinion on that, how relations will move forward with, with Venezuela and what that means for immigrants and Venezuelans currently in the country. Yes, this is actually something I write about. I am, as you, you mentioned, I'm a columnist and I also contribute to the uh, Caracas Chronicles, which is Venezuela news in English for the US, actually for US and everywhere, and also for one of the newspapers. And I've been writing a lot for maybe two years on TPS for Venezuela. So I was very happy to hear that the Biden administration approved the TPS yesterday and, and did it. Uh, I wanna mention the way that it should be done because uh, Trump right before he left power in January 20th, the eve of, uh, of his leaving power, he approved something called DED, the Deferred Enforcement Departure, which is not a legal status, it's actually a protection against deportation, which was a, a, a very good first step, but I kept arguing that the next natural step for the US with, Vene with, the Venez with Venezuelan migrants in the country 
was to approve the TPS. And I've been, I've, it was actually offered by Biden in his government plan, campaign plan, that he would approve in the first 100 days. And, and, and it happened. And we'll, as part of the Venezuelan American community, I'm very happy. I'm very excited about this, this opportunity. Um, I specialize on migration. This is something that I, I as I said, right, but also I'm always uh, up to date in terms of the arguments for and against. Of course, TPS will provide not just protection against depart deportation, but also a document, a legal document that says that, that Venezuelans can be in the country and as well as a work permit, um, except that it is only for 18 months. You know, and, and, and a lot of Venezuelans are asking, well, what, what's going to happen with me? Can I go back to the status that I had? Do I go back to irregular irregularity once the status expires? Um, from my uh, studying the, the application of TPS in the US, I see that it's been renewed. The, the countries that have already be, been designated uh, countries that could receive uh, beneficiaries of TPS have been, the, the, it's been renewing every 18 months. In the case of El Salvador, the first TPS was given in 2001, 20 years ago. So I usually tell Venezuelans, I cannot predict the future, but I would presume considering precedent that the Venezuelan uh, TPS is going to be renewed. So it, it means a lot uh, for the Venezuelan migrant community, those who are in irregularity. It means a lot politically too, in the sense that it is a campaign promise delivered uh, I would presume it's going to change, I, uh, I presume, but of course I cannot see the, the future, of course, um, the conversations, the political conversations that happen back in our campus at FIU Miami and, and around South Florida. I think this is going to have an influence and the whole approval of the TPS from now on is going to be a campaign issue for a lot of uh, politicians from the, from from the areas where the Venezuelans have settled, and we know that it's Florida, we know that it's up in New, you know, Northeast as well as Texas and uh, Texas mostly, um, is going to be an issue. So this is going to impact U.S. politics too, I think, and South Florida politics definitely. Um, and then you have the other conversation or the other. Uh, agenda, which is regime change, right? So you have the humanitarian response on one hand and then regime change agenda on the other. So these two, um, from the standpoint of the work I do, even though I'm a political scientist, my current work is humanitarian. You don't combine the agendas. One, you, you do what you do in the humanitarian front, independent of what happens in the more political uh, uh, aspects of the issue. Um, but uh, what I'm glad to see is that the Biden administration is not abandoning the regime change conversation and is using different uh, approaches to address the Venezuelan crisis. I mean, it's, it's an economic, humanitarian, political crisis. It's really the breakdown of democracy happening in Venezuela. And I'm very happy to see that they, they're already, for instance, considering how to tweak sanctions that, that, that the ones that have been imposed both in terms of individuals as well as sectors they are already considering how to uh, tweak those so that there's no more suffering in the, on the humanitarian front. And, and there's other, I'm pretty sure there are things happening that we don't know of to engage in some sort of dialogue with the Maduro regime and his, the people he has around. Uh, I do know, for instance, that the military option is not an option on, on the part of Biden, but it wasn't an option for, on the Trump for the Trump administration either. And it's not an option for the region. So I guess we, we have, we, I'm hoping that things are happening that we do not necessarily find out on the, on the regime change aspect of the Venezuela issue. Okay, thank you. That, that it is a contentious issue. And of course, living in Miami, Venezuelans. Are you guys all in Miami? I think most of us are, um, but you know, of course, our FIU community. There's a lot of people from Venezuela, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, there are some questions from the audience now, so I'll start with Brittany. Hi. Yes. Okay. So to like answer your previous question, I am in Miami, but I am a Tampa native. So oh! I mean, 
you know, Pero I would like, <laughs> like go USF, but like FIU has my heart. So yeah, same here, no. same here. I'm, I'm, I actually did my master's at USF. So I love that's, them both. That's what I was going to ask my question about because both a master's and a PhD are on like my bucket list. So I was going to ask what motivated you or what kept you motivated to pursue a master's and a PhD. And how did you go about choosing which institution you like studied at? Because I mean, I got a lot of stares leaving Tampa, like, why aren't you going to USF? So I just wanted to know how you balance that. But you did, you're doing your undergrad. Yes, I'm at my undergrad at FIU in ling linguistics and policy. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I think the reason I kept studying from my bachelor's to the master's to the PhD was more of a um, conjuntura, no? like a particular juncture in my life. And the fact that we, uh, at, at that point, my family and my parents are professors, we decided to stay in the US. And the way to stay regularly was to continue studying while we waited for our immigration process to to progress and, and in the end it was uh, resolved positively. So, and we knew, but we, we did not want to fall out of our status. So I kept studying and I love to study. So I just uh, continue uh, and I wanted to be a lawyer and I still do. Maybe I will go into law school at some point, maybe at FIU. <laughs> este, so I, political science was the closest to the, the things that were interesting to me. Uh, the transition from the master to the PhD, I will say that I was super interested in the inter-American nature of FIU. I mean, the connection that FIU has to the region is impressive. I love politics. So FIU happens to be connected with local politics, but also with the politicians in the region that I uh, that I admire, that I, I follow, or I criticize. I mean, uh, FIU had the, this poder de convocatorio, you know, this capacity to call on these leaders and bring them to campus. And, and that, to me, really no other institution had it. Um, so, so that was definitely a plus for me to choose the PhD program at FIU. And then I encountered professors who were really uh, they, they, they gave opportunities for me to contribute to the agendas that were interesting to me. Uh, and, and, you know, I did my master's degree at USF and it was good, a good dynamic with professors, but never like FIU. FIU is esta arribisimo in terms of uh, professors who are always kind of like uh, pushing you up. To this day, I finished my PhD in 2005. Gamarra still pitches me interviews or, you know, pitches my, my bio to some people who are considering somebody with my profile. To this day, this is still happening. And, you know, an example is also uh, how open Carlos and the whole team and also connecting with people back in the Miami campus to support other alumni. So, you know, the, the combination of these things, which you, you know from, the, from your first engagement with FIU, with people at FIU uh, was what did the, you know, turn me. <laughs> Thank you. You just, ah, I, I, I want to complete something, Brittany, <laughs> on the why, as a woman in a very masculine multilateral environment, I also felt that going for the PhD would give me a different type of position to relate to other men. Uh, because they have their networks, I know each other. A lot of them came with political uh, padrinos, you know, with political godfathers and mostly godfathers. I had nothing. I, I don't. I don't come from politics. Uh, I love politics, but I like to do it based on merit, not on. Although now at this age, I can understand the value of connections. I don't take me wrong, but um, I felt like. And, and, and I can confirm that this was the case. They looked at me differently just because I did my PhD. And I have continued you know, doing practical work where I am at the OES, but I haven't abandoned work, academic work. So I publish every now and then. I, I'm always publishing in the issues that are interesting to me, migration, gender, politics, uh, women in politics. And that also presents my, they look at me differently because I have also continued on the more academic front. 
So just a tip for you guys as you develop your careers. Sometimes a, a graduate work, you will see that in terms of practical use, it definitely creates a, a better you professionally, but it's not like you're gonna use it every day. However, it projects a different, a, a more assertive and I don't know, people look at you with more respect. At least in very masculine worlds, I can say that's been very helpful to me. Thank you. That was truly inspiring. And you like solidified that I made the better choice. So thank you. Yes, you did. I think so. Yes. Although I love USF. Go Bulls. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brittany, for that question. Um, glad to know that we all contemplate law school at some point in our lives, even if we have a PhD, like it is the case with uh, Dr. Munoz Bogotian and Dr. Montgomery Orozco. So thank you. <laughs> Next up is uh, Natalia. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. So it's uh, such an inspiration and motivation to listen to you. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Thanks. And you're transporting me to Latin America, uh, where I'm from, I'm from Argentina. And I, I, on my first year of PhD at FIU, course in international relations. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is my dream career. My first life was in international business and my life in that experience. And then to transition, I went to volunteer in the Middle East with refugees from Syria and Iraq. Oh, and wow. then to Honduras with the um, migrants, the deported migrants from the US. I was coordinating the pastoral of the human mobility for the Bay Islands. Oh, wow, um, how cool. Yeah, so I returned last year, in the, a year ago, exactly, um, I mean, amid the pandemic. And I've been supporting people there through here. Uh, from here and also I have some people on the migration road that have been kidnapped so I'm doing this on the side like a volunteer right like providing support and trying to get these people back somewhere either to the states or back to Honduras so um, my question to you is because um, I'm a fa fast track PhD because I am transferring my master's degree in global affairs and um, so I, I've been considering uh, finishing, right, everything, like I'm a TA at FIU, and I'm going to be doing comps either in summer or fall this year, and then work on dissertation. And when you mentioned that you uh, did your comps and dissertation while working, right? So yes. I would like to ask you, um, how difficult was it and how much it delayed your PhD degree? Because when I, I listen to you, I really want to start working. <laughs> I'm a hands-on It can be done. Definitely, it can be done. It just takes a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. But I, I accepted the job, and I remember, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Tim Power. He was my advisor. He scolded me on the phone. He told me, how could you do this to us? Why are you accepting a job and also continuing your PhD? Only one third of those who do, who, who do that end up finishing and even less. After all, we invested in you. How could you do this to me? I, I found you scholarships and this. Oh my God, it was for her. I said, no, Dr. Power, this is something I want to do. I'm going for this. This is where, and I will finish while working. Okay, we'll see, we'll see. Actually, on, my def on the defense of my dissertation, he was part of my committee because he was, he scolded me, but I love him. I still do to this day. He's now in, in Oxford University, but. I still stay in touch. Um, he apologized to me in front of my parents who came to the defense. My husband, I, I had just got married. He was in the defense. He said, I have to apologize to Betile because I said to her that she would never finish the dissertation and her PhD and she did. So, okay, I take it back. <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of work, but it's, it can be done. Um, I, what, I was working full time. I, I still had to do the three comps, you know, the three written comps because I had major and two minors and then do the dissertation, the, the proposal defense, and then finally the defense of the dissertation. So it was kind of like the, all those steps. I'm missing one, the oral defense of the comps. So three written comps, oral defense of comps, defense of the proposal of the dissertation, and then finally the dissertation defense. And what, what worked for me because I am a morning person, is that I would wake up at 5 a.m. every day to study, yes. And uh, by 7 a.m., 7.30, get ready for work and then go do my full day of work. And I did not do much in the evenings because I was fried, my brain was fried. 
but uh, I used the mornings and it was something that I envisioned it would be a long routine. I mean, it would be a routine that I would have to sustain for a few years. And this is really what I did, giving myself breaks in between. No, so my, my first goal was the comps, the component of the PhD. So I organized myself and, you know, it was almost, almost a year, the whole process. FIU was super uh, flexible with me because I would have to fly in from DC to Miami, uh, you know, go and, and take the exam and then trying to accommodate the date so that I wouldn't have to be, because I had to pay all of it by myself. You know, with, I had a job and I had a salary, but it's still a lot of money. Plus pay intuition because I needed to be enrolled to be able to do this. No, it, it was like a, a major uh, uh, coordination, articulating everything, but uh, it can be done with a lot of discipline, uh, preparing yourself mentally for it to be a, a long time, and also scheduling breaks, no? a month off of you know, waking up normal hours and not doing much, uh, and then you know, scheduling maybe a couple of months later after a, a long stretch, waking up at that time and finishing things, right? Um, what else can I give you in terms of advice? Your advisor has a, an important role. In my case, Gamarra, Gamarra really helped me facilitating interviews, reviewing my, my you know, drafts of my manuscript. Uh, so cultivating that relationship with your advisor is also something that is going to help in the end. In, even in a, at a human level, it's really going to help in terms of you finishing. But continue because you can do it. You can do it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, actually, that's how I did my master's, working full time, waking up exactly. at five <laughs> to study before going to work. And then exactly. it took a lot of years. It's just so. a matter of putting together a plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the second question uh, for the OEA, sorry, I don't, that's the, yeah, sure. in, uh, in Spanish, not in English. Um, is it uh, easy to apply for a job or you had to start as an intern? Uh, I started as an intern. That's the, like the way to get it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's what worked for me. I had done, uh, I did an internship when I was a master's student at USF. I did an internship at the UN. It was only me and another Mexican uh, woman who were accepted in a sea of people from like 300 people from all over the world. And that gave me, me dio el gusanito de los multilaterales, no? It gave me the the interest and, and I said, you know, multilateral institutions, this is where I want to be. This is what I love. And I went to, I started, I started my PhD at FIU and I also like you trans, transferred the 30 credits from my master's degree into the PhD program at FIU. And I was done with coursework a year later. And that summer I applied for the internship at the OAS non-paid internship. I, I think you guys were talking about paid and unpaid internships before. I, I heard a, a little bit about that. And for me, it was hard, but it was an investment that, that I, I still, I, nowadays I realized it was, it was a good investment, so saving the money and, and getting support so that I could do the internship. And when I was here, I got uh, the opportunity to, for this job, doing something completely unrelated to political science. It was um, monitoring or auditing expenses in a pro, in an account in, in accounts accounts payable accounts all of this this stuff in a project in in Guatemala on conflict resolution in Guatemala which had nothing to do with what I <laughs> was studying I already had a master's degree it was like the well in the end I took it I gave my two hundred percent and I kept uh, progressing within the hierarchy and now I have a directive position uh, in the in the institution and also nowadays nobody can tell me lies about the management of projects and the funding and accounts payable because now I know it no. from, from, <laughs> from within so just to say that all the experiences help somehow and, and and prepare you for what you will do later in life so oh, wow. it was an internship and and then I've done my career at the OES. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, you are just the person I need to listen to because and I whenever you, you guys, uh, Carlos can share my my info. I can also share my social media, my Twitter, Instagram. Uh, on Instagram, I, I I didn't mention, but I'm also doing, and maybe Ashley is gonna ask about this, but uh, I'm doing a lot of training for professional young people 
women as well as migrants. A lot of fellow Venezuelans who have start are have had no choice but to start uh, their or continue their career, but in many times is reinventing themselves in new countries. I, I, I have been working on generating content on this. And whenever, uh, Natalia, at tus órdenes, okay. I am available. My email, my Instagram, my todo. So. And on that note, if I can jump in, sorry, uh, Ashley, but uh, I'm all about Oprah's book club, which I know your book will be on. You have news? I don't know if you've... Uh... I do. It's already launched. It's in Amazon. It's called Éxito en Cápsulas. Go. Yes. Uh, in English, it would be Success in Capsules. And what I... Uh, this was kind of... I, I call it my COVID-19 baby. <laughs> because I, you know, we were sent home. I, I was always traveling. I was always, you know, in, in, in conference presentations. And now I had all this time. So... I had been for years coaching a lot of young professionals as well as fellow women in, in similar uh, positions um, face the challenges at, of growing professionally and you know how to write, uh, please read my CV. What do I do if somebody's always uh, stealing my ideas in meetings? What do I do if I want to go, I, I keep asking to be included in that mission to Honduras and I'm not included, what do I do? And then I, I was always sharing how things that worked for me. And what I did is uh, via my Instagram account, I started doing uh, IG lives, you know, live uh, trainings on some things like how to give public presentations, how to put together your bio, and how to have a difficult conversation when you wanna ask for a raise or you wanna be included in a project and they keep, uh, keep kicking you out. Uh, so I, it's in Spanish. I've been doing it in Spanish. I hopefully I will transition into English soon. But this is the book. It's available in Amazon. If you're interested, if you read Spanish and need that advice, um, I'll put also the the link here in the in the chat. Uh, and again, with the idea of sharing what worked for me in terms of achieving the and, and you know also how you define success. That's another question. No? Success to me is having influence on the agendas at the regional level, because I am a Latin Americanist at heart, influencing in the agendas that are meaningful to me, that include my, you know, human rights, migrants, gender, women in politics, or, you know, and, and how do I uh, ensure that I keep advancing professionally and influencing those, convers and those conversations, which also include, by the way, the use of social media. And this is a realization and my advice to you as women who are professionals or are becoming professionals, how to use social media to um, connect to the agendas that are meaningful to you. So I'll put the, thank you, Carlos, for the cue <laughs> on the, on Exito and Capsulas. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm so proud. And look, this is the back. And it has like sections where you can put your notes. So. And Batilda, that was a uh, a pandemic project. Yeah, something you probably weren't expecting, right? I wasn't. I, I tell you, I, I I had been doing it, and I realized that. Uh, and I, I operate on this model of paying it forward. I mean, people who were kind to me and gave me opportunities, uh, I am very thankful to them. But I feel I re a responsibility to also give these to other people. And I thought this was the best way to 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 do it, not to put it in writing and then uh, share it via a book. And, and again, I had all this free time. We were in at the house 24 seven. I was always traveling. I wasn't traveling anymore. What do I do? And, and I decided to, to write the book. So very proud and, and, and happy to share that with all of you too. Yeah, the, the book was, was sort of my next question. Um, so it's only available in Spanish, I would assume. Yes, and, for now. Okay, could you sort of ex give us a little bit of a sneak peek of the, the five capsules to success and maybe yes. why, why did you choose the word capsules? We were just curious about why it was capsules and not tips. <laughs> yes, something. because it's not, it's not as short as a tip. It's, it's more of a reflection, an invitation. Mm -hmm to reflect on things that are uh, crucial for a, a professional, for someone uh, to grow professionally. I put the link, I know, se lo puse a Eric. Wait, give me a second. Let me see. 
can be one. Este, yes, so um, it's, it's, it's beyond a very concrete tip. Actually, within each of the capsules, there's a lot of tips for different things. And why, what I decided to focus, to uh, go to cover in each of the, the sections or the five capsules are, the first one is how to plan a, per, a career path with a purpose. Be, going beyond really the more romantic uh, definitions of finding your purpose. I mean, what I argue in the, in the book is that it's not something that falls from the sky or you have a revelation and yeah, here, here's my purpose. Uh, it's actually probably aligned to my ethic, work ethic. I believe that you have to sit down and dedicate time to uh, evaluate where, you know, the things that you're very good at, the things that uh, uh, bring the best in you, evaluate also those that do not bring the best in you. Uh, even ask people who love you or people who are connected to, to you to help you figure that out and then uh, put together a plan, a deliberate plan to ensure that you are professionally where you want to be and that you feel realized as a person doing what you do. And I believe it's not impossible because a lot of people say, oh, it's so hard to do some, to have a job that you love. It's so hard. I mean, I just do my, the work I do because I pay, that pays my bills and, you know, I find purpose through other things outside. I mean, of course, that is a pot potential scenario for a lot of people, but I argue that, that the finding a career that where you feel that you are contributing, adding value to something greater, adding value to other people is possible. And this is something that you would do whether they pay you or not. But if they pay you, even better. And I think there's a way to, to achieve that. So that's one uh, invitation to reflect on. The second one is how to prepare a professional biography. Uh, you would be surprised. A lot of people, and I wonder, you, you know, those of you who are here, how many of you have your professional biography ready? Una, dos, tres. So three. It's not the majority. And, and you, know, you would think that this is something everyone who is systematically working to um, strengthen themselves professionally has ready. And, and in, in fact, it's not the case. And this is something uh, I realized when I was writing the book. So I provide a process to actually put together a professional biography that, is, that is, differentiates itself from others that a lot of employers review. And, you know, it is, for instance, something as concrete as uh, doing it and not just showing where you worked, but showing the legacy you left in that particular job. And, and I argue, for instance, that even if you're just starting professionally, there's ways to use the trips you used in the summer, the volunteer work that you did, uh, the uh, areas where you contributed in, during your bachelor's degree, framed in a... Um, results-based manner that can strengthen the way that you pre present yourself professionally. And I give a template of how to do this. Uh, another one was, uh, uh, that uh, was also very, um, a lot of people kept asking, what do you do? I do a lot of presentations, my friends. <laughs> Things I did, I do all the time. And I do it you know, with, along with ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of social development, but I also do it uh, with students. So uh, I have a formula that has worked for me to ensure that people remember what I say. And what I do in the book is show what is that guion or script that I follow where uh, I ensure that whatever I say is memorable. And that, you know, tips that are included, um, for instance, um, relate to ensuring that you respect the time that you're given. Uh, as well as, for instance, writing your script and ensuring that it has, that you always speak in trios, siempre hablar en tres. Whatever you are explaining about, don't go over and, and, and on the tangent and, and start discussing many, no. Prepare yourself, and this is a lot of work ethic, deliberately sitting down and planning the three things that when, when people talk about your presentation, you want them to remember, and then structure your presentation that way. And the last two have to do with how to have difficult conversations that everyone avoids. But at this point in my career, I realize, I realize are very important to have and to have them opportunely. And I provide also a formula of how to dis differentiate um, hechos, o sea, whatever happened, how you felt about them, 
what are your opinions about whatever you need to address in a difficult conversation, the consequences that it has, and how to get to a resolution that includes asking for something that most women are not comfortable with, asking for things, and ensuring also that you, uh, not ensuring, but that in, it may include you giving something up. No, and, and I explained based on my practice, what has worked for me, how to ensure that you get uh, the outcome that you need based on the com difficult conversation that you had. And uh, in my particular field, um, and the way that it's happened to me is for instance, when they were putting together election of, at the beginning, when I was very junior, putting together election observation missions. I remember the first one uh, that was being sent to Bolivia and my dissertation uh, is, of course, Eduardo Gamarra helped me, but my dissertation was on the Bolivian electoral system. And I wanted to go to that mission. It was gonna be like uh, three missions over the course of a year. And, I, and how do I get the courage? How do I, stru do I structure my request to be included in that mission? And I, and I share what worked for me. And, and eventually, and you know, I also discuss that sometimes in difficult conversations, you try once and it doesn't work. You try a second time and you, know, you still don't get admitted to the project that is interesting to you. But based on my experience, I realized that if you have the courage and the structure to make your argument, maybe not the first time, but the second or the third, they will include you because they will. And no hay, no hay pele. So, and then the last one is on, um, wait, I forget. <laughs> I got inspired on that. Oh, the first one is the, the, the most interesting to me because I do a lot of research on this for women in politics. Uh, it's, uh, it deals with how to identify your glass ceilings and how do, do they manifest when you are in a professional environment. And, and I review things and I actually based it off of the work of a, a North, um, Norwegian sociologist, Berit, se llama Berit As, her name is Berit As. She did it for women in politics in, in Norway, but there's seven domination techniques that are used, permanently used against women as well as other minority groups. Well, not minorities, but uh, groups, uh, uh, historically excluded groups in professional environments. And I explained what are those seven techniques of domination and how to combat them. Things as mansplaining, man interrupting for women, but also the use of racist jokes or the, and then for them, for the whoever is exerting this uh, domination to say, ah, oh, you're not a team player, you know, can, you can't take a joke, this and that. You know, I explain all of those. Or, you know, when, uh, when you're speaking as a young professional and, the more senior people start watching their their uh, iPhones or or they start talking to each other, ha ha ha, and laughing. You know how to how do you react to this? And, and most of us say, oh, this happened to me, and I never in the moment I don't know what to do. And then you know uh, later in the evening I said I should have said this. I should well, I, you know, there's a way for you to prepare yourself psychologically to deal with these situations, and I explain that in the book too. So among many other advice of things that worked for me. Well, thank you. That was very insightful. We'll definitely be buying your book, even though I'm a slow when I read in Spanish, but it's okay. fine. <laughs> you can uh, take it as a way to practice Spanish. <laughs> exactly. Uh, career development. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions because we're about done with time. But thank you so much, Dr. Munoz Bogosian, for speaking with us today and for sharing your tips, your capsules for career success. Definitely really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Carlos and Eric. You've been the best in giving me this opportunity to share with this super chévere group, select group of women from FIU. And I put actually also my my Twitter and Instagram handles in case you are active in social media, you can find me there and the link to the book if you are interested in, in buying it. And, and, and again, also my email, if you ever need, want to apply to the OES for an internship, have questions about the OES or how to apply for jobs there, you need any insider info, cuenten conmigo, you can count on me, okay? Thank you so much, Batilda. And uh, I, yes, I agree with uh, Maureen. Great job moderating Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. 
Um, and uh, Marina, of course, is up next uh, to moderate. I see our uh, special guest, uh, alumna friend of mine, Virginia, is in the room. And I think uh, while uh, I work with Virginia to make sure her colleagues get connected, if you uh, need all of two minutes uh, to, to go grab anything or take a breather, we have about uh, just that. Looking forward to the next great session. Hello, Brianna, nice to meet you. Are you connected? Okay. I think we have our entire uh, USDA uh, team uh, connected here. I'm gonna do a quick Zoom check to make sure all, uh, all can see, all can hear. Yannet, Elizabeth, Virginia, and Brianna, you're all with us. Hi, yes, that's Yannet. I can hear you. Awesome, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. This is Brianna, I can hear you also. Awesome, thank you so much for being here and to Virginia for organizing. Um, we were just transitioning between our uh, 10 a.m. session and, and, uh, and this and making sure all four of you uh, joined. So I'm going to uh, use this for any uh, students who may have stepped away for a moment in between those two sessions to know we are about ready to go and to be here and um, and ready for um, our first session uh, with federal agency oriented. For our USDA friends uh, to have some context as, uh, as we get going, thank you all so much uh, as is probably relayed uh, by Virginia. This is the second annual uh, of the program we're gonna be doing every year, Women in Politics and Policy in person again one day soon. And, uh, and so far uh, in, in uh, not even halfway through the program yet this morning, met with uh, FIU uh, alumna on, on a prominent office on the Hill, met with our alumna just now from the Organization of American States, met with uh, some, uh, some advocacy folks yesterday, including from the Democracy Fund. So really uh, excited to get some insight this morning on, um, on federal agencies, the role the USDA plays in our everyday lives that we may not know and how your internal employee groups uh, help spur some uh, representation and inclusion 
uh, within the agency. So I suppose with all that being said, as, as people transition back, I'm going to be out of the way from here other than to thank all four of you and our alumna Virginia uh, and turn it over to our moderator, our student moderator, Maureen. And I'm very uh, excited for this particular session because I would say in some ways Maureen's own interest uh, in women in agriculture, uh, which she will introduce is, is, uh, is the genesis of this entire uh, hour today. So Maureen, over to you. Okay, that's correct. Well, first I wanna thank you. Eric, thank you for putting together this panel. And I'd like to begin by saying good morning and thank you to our speakers who are taking time out of their busy days uh, and schedules to speak to us. I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they're listed on the program. First is Brianna Serion. Brianna is a plant health safeguarding specialist in the plant inspection station at the USDA's Animal Health and Plant Health Inspection Service and she is currently a board member of the Hispanic American cultural effort. Before working for the USDA, Brianna earned a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Rutgers University. Next is Yanet Rodriguez, who is an international programming, program specialist at the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. She is currently co-chair of the Hispanic American cultural effort. Yannet graduated from Texas A&M, which stands for Agriculture and Mechanical, in case you're interested, with a bachelor's degree in animal science, then received a graduate certificate in intelligence and analysis from American Military University and a graduate certificate in international and global studies from Virginia Tech, where she also earned a master of natural sciences. Elizabeth Yippe, is an international trade specialist in the processed products division in the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. And she is currently a member of the Women in Agricultural Agriculture Executive Committee. Elizabeth participated in the study abroad program at the School for International Training in Geneva, Switzerland before graduating from George Washington University with a bachelor's degree in international relations and affairs. And she earned a master's degree in international relations and affairs from the Elliott School of International Affairs. Last but not least, I would like to introduce Virginia Morgan. Virginia is a human resources specialist at the USDA Farm Production and Conservation Business Center and is currently a board member of the Hispanic American Cultural Effort. Virginia is a panther an alumna of FIU where she earned a bachelor's degree in women's studies, which is something the two of us have in common. Then she earned two master's degrees, one in liberal studies from the University of Miami and a master's degree in project management from Boston University. Time's up. Thanks for everyone for showing up today. <laughs> now I'm like kidding. Um, so anyhow, um, as, Eric, uh, as Eric stated, I actually um, have an interest in horticulture and agriculture. Um, I've been writing about the United States seed industry. And um, so the USDA is definitely of interest to me. I'm gonna start by um, opening up the floor uh, with this question. What would each of you like our participants to know about your positions and the behind the scenes work you, you and your teams do to protect American agricultural and trade interests? Anyone's free to start. Okay, this is Yannette. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and I'm, I'm always happy and open to talk to people that are interested in international affairs, specifically in agriculture. As you mentioned, my background is agriculture, but um, I actually started my career in international development. Um, my whole plan was to go to vet school and become a veterinarian. And then I got introduced to international development. I was like, oh my God, this is completely different. It's something that I'm really interested in. So I just continued um, and finished my animal um, science degree and, and continued working on USAID and um, USDA funded programs. So uh, to your question of uh, what I would like the students to know about behind the scenes work. So for starters, when people think of agriculture, think of USDA, you think of domestic markets, but mm -hmm. um, the Foreign Agricultural Service is actually the international arm of USDA. Um, our mission is to link US agriculture to the world to enhance export opportunities as well as global food security. Um, we currently have 96 offices in uh, over 76 countries. And um, it's important to know that although we have staff here in the US across the US, including Hawaii and Alaska, um, we also have uh, foreign service officers overseas. When people hear foreign service officers, they most 
likely only think of State Department, but USDA also has agricultural attaches overseas and they play a very important role because they work not only to uh, open new markets for US agriculture, but also to create those partnerships with the host countries where they're working in. Mm -hmm. So my role uh, is to promote trade, economic development and improve food security through capacity building uh, or capacity building programs overseas. Uh, I develop, coordinate and implement workshops as well as technical consultations on multiple um, plant health and food safety topics. Um, my programs have assisted foreign government counterparts with legislative reviews, technical discussions on possible trade barriers, adoption of internationally recognized science-based standards. Um, and I work with foreign government counterparts, uh, academic institutions, both in the US as well as overseas and uh, NGOs and public and private organizations. We work very closely with the US private sector and um, we'd like to make those same linkages when we're overseas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? that would like to answer? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, so first, I wanted to begin with how I started working with the USDA. Um, also, sorry, I'm in my car right now because I have an appointment at 1130. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I had enough time to talk in here. Um, so I graduated from Rutgers back in May 2019, and that April, um, during my my last semester there, can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, all right, I'm going to keep talking. Um, I was searching USA Jobs, and I found um, a student trainee position, and um, it's considered a pathways internship and that's how I got my foot. Um, so for those of you who are students, low student position, if you graduate positions on USA jobs, it's a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, so when I started working, I began on a domestic program and for Spotted Lanternfly. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Spotted Lanternfly, but um, it's an invasive plant. I think we might have lost, lost Brianna. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you are. Would you like to try again, Brianna? How's that? Okay, it's coming back. The audio is coming back, go ahead. Maybe if you turn off your video, Brianna. Oh, did you hear that, Brianna? Someone suggested turning off your video. Okay. Uh, you can hear that. Oh, no. I started talking. <laughs> okay, it's better now. Go ahead. Oh, maybe we'll loop back. Yeah, maybe I can I can go in the meantime. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Maureen, for the great introduction. I also work for the Foreign Agricultural Service, and uh, I like Janet's uh, overview of FAS. I work in the trade policy area of the agency. And what we do here in, in the trade policy area, I, I want to actually, before I go into a trade policy, FAS is kind of divided into four pillars if we want to look at it from that perspective. So Janet works in the uh, trade capacity building, but we also have trade promotion. We have trade policy and market intelligence. And so I work in the trade policy area and, and the, within the trade policy, we have two focus areas. And one of them is like the commodity analysis and the other one is like the country analysis. And ultimately what we do in, in this analysis, we provide the US government position uh, on agriculture that we can uh, discuss this bilaterally with other countries. Uh, and we can also frame our US government position at the regional level and multilateral level at international organizations as well. 
Um, and this is again regarding the uh, US uh, agriculture position. So ultimately it is to open markets and maintain markets for US agriculture exports. Um, so I concentrate a lot in the processed products area, uh, promoting our processed agricultural products uh, and this, uh, my office uh, goes all the way from uh, non-alcoholic beverages to infant formula, all in between, like you can imagine, like uh, processed fruits and vegetable, your frozen food, your juices, coffee. I mean, everything falls into, into the office I work in. Um, and one way that uh, we work on or in the commodity division I work on is uh, we review uh, WTO agreement, the World Trade Organization agreements, um, and also we, uh, we review codex standards, which codex come from the uh, FAO, the Food and uh, Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, FAO develops um, the, the codex, not FAO, but the codex uh, committees develops uh, standards for for agriculture and and that this is very important and helpful uh, in order for the world to have like a global standard on a particular food product. Otherwise, this country has a standard, we another country has a standard, and it's difficult to trade. So this codex standard mm -hmm. facilitates trade by making sure we all are on the same page, kind of thing. Um, so so we, that we all have the same the same standard. However, some countries don't don't have uh, the capacity to to align with codex standards, or they just don't know about codex standards. I mean, it's so so complicated. But uh, something that we could do is providing capacity building to help countries align with the codex standards. Uh, we could also um, engage bilaterally through our overseas offices. To discuss codex standards. We also raise these issues when we go to WTO meetings, uh, World Trade Organization meetings. Uh, we raise these issues and, and we encourage the country to, to follow codex. Um, again, this so we, we ultimately aim to um, uh, maintain markets by ensuring that countries are, are following international trade agreements. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention or um, highlight one more time is uh, the engagement at uh, IOS, uh, International Organization. So we also in the trade policy area, we uh, also have a, an office called the Multilateral Affairs Division and they, they have two, two kind of two sub offices. Uh, one of these is the WTO office, the World Trade Organization, and the other one is General IOS. And in this IO spaces, we engage at FAO for a Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, as I mentioned. We engage also with the PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, World Health mm -hmm. Organization, uh, I mean, United Nations, I mean, you, you, you name it. Anything that talks about agriculture and food, we will be there. Uh, so overall, that's, that's kind of what we do in the trade policy space. I want to briefly mention the other two areas. Uh, one is the, the trade promotion. Uh, in this, we have a lot of uh, trade programs, trade uh, trade mission events where uh, our overseas offices and we bring U.S. ranchers, farmers, industries to show their products in other countries and provide test, testing uh, examples. This could be at a, at a show, at an event short event, this could be uh, at a supermarket, et cetera. Just introducing US food to others, consumers, educating consumers overseas about the very high quality food that we have in the US. So this is the trade, trade uh, programs, the trade uh, promotion area, but we also have the market intelligence. And I think Janet, you're gonna talk a little bit more about the market intelligence. Maybe I'll let Janet, but that's an overview of my, my work in, in FD. Yeah, actually, let's see if Brianna's back. I know she has to log off very quickly, so. Hmm. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know if I should just leave the video off um, yes, for please. now. Oh, please. Okay, all right. Um, so I don't know what you guys heard from before. Um, I was just talking about how I started uh, as a Pathways intern. Um, so if you're on USA Jobs looking at positions, um, if you're a current student, I recommend looking out for student trainee as the, the um, these are you.
internships. And then once you graduate, if you look out for um, recent graduate, that um, I think as long as you graduate two years, uh, you qualify for those positions. So that's just um, a little tip on how to get your foot in the door with USA. USDA. Um, that's how I made my way in. So um, back when I began as on the spotted lanternfly program. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with what that bug is, but it's an invasive. Uh, it's native to the like China, some other areas in Asia, um, but this bug can be catastrophic to certain agricultural commodities, especially grapes that are typically grown to produce wine. Um, so here in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, um, we have tons of vineyards. Uh, so it's really important that we need to protect them. Um, the bug was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014 and it spread rapidly. Um, it often hops on like trucks and um, trains and it can, you know, go from one spot to, to miles away. So that's how it moves. Um, my work consisted of bringing contracted companies out um, to spray pesticides. So we were actually treating the spotted lantern flies host tree, which is also invasive. Um, it's called tree of heaven. Also, Alanthus altissima is the scientific name. Um, so we were treating those trees and then we were killing those trees, but also spraying larger ones with insecticide. Um, that way the, the spotted lantern fly feeds on the tree, they ingest the insecticide and they die. Um, so it wasn't an eradication program, just a way to stop the spread. I also, uh, back in November, I did a month long rotation down in South Carolina. Um, it's a similar program for the Asian longhorn beetle, another invasive bug. Um, so with the USDA, we do a lot of domestic programs to control invasive species. Those are just two examples. Um, back in December, 2019, I, was, I transitioned into an officer position so I currently work at a plant inspection station um, in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now this is right near the, the Newark and New York ports, which it's the third busiest port in the country. Um, so we get all kinds of stuff in via ships and also through the airport. Uh, we also inspect stuff that comes in through the mail from USPS, FedEx, uh, DHL. Um, so what I do on a daily basis is um, I receive imported plant products and I inspect them. Um, so that could be anything from cactus, succulents, tulip bulbs, um, petunia cuttings, all kinds of stuff. Um, and what I'm looking for is um, insects, plant pathogens, and seeds. Um, so we at my facility, we have a, uh, a botanist, a plant pathologist, and three entomologists. Um, so when I find something on these plant products, I, I bring them to um, one of the identifiers and they identify what I found. And from there, um, if it's actionable, we can either re-export the product, destroy it uh, via incineration, or uh, we can fumigate it with methyl bromide. Um, and then if it's not actionable, it's, it's on its way to the customer. Um, so, you know, we're just safeguarding uh, different commodities that are coming in and out of the country. Um, I'm making sure that all the proper paperwork is there. So to enter the country, you need a phytosanitary certificate, import permits. Um, if it's an endangered species, um, you need a CITES paperwork. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it. Um, so, yeah, I've my perspective on a, a lot of different plant products has changed throughout the years. Um, I know the average person might go into shop right and you just buy your produce. You don't really think about who handled it, where it came from, how it got to the grocery store. Um, so working for the USDA, I've seen a lot of you know the background stuff that goes on. Um, it's really interesting. And then I need to head out soon. So one last thing I wanted to say was. Um, to work for the USDA, you don't need a degree in horticulture or environmental science or ecology. Um, my coworker, her degree is in public health. Um, and it's, you know, public health is super important because the, the products that are coming into the country, you want to make sure that they're safe um, for human consumption and, 
you know, that they're not bringing in an, an invasive pest uh, that might destroy products here. Um, so yeah, you can have a degree in like almost anything and I can guarantee you that the USDA is gonna have a position for you. So um, it's a great department to work for, tons of opportunities and um, yeah, check USC, USA jobs. Um, that's gonna help, that's gonna be how you, uh, you get your foot in the door. But um, like I said, I have to head out. I wish I could stay this whole time, um, but it was a pleasure talking to you guys. Well, thank you, thank you, Brianna. We know that stable food supply is essential to national and global security. So thanks for protecting ours. Okay, thank so I, you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was just saying, Ma Maureen, if I can yes. add to it, um, I'd yes, also please. like to link, um, Brianna didn't bring this up, but APHIS also has a foreign service uh, division. So they have representatives overseas. And um, it's important to know that, you know, when Elizabeth and I and all our programs at Foreign Agricultural Service work with foreign government counterparts, you know, on legislative review or giving them our feedback on, you know, if we see any potential trade barriers, we also work with APHIS. We work closely with APHIS and the Food Safety Inspection Services to make sure that the policies that are being recommended align with you know, our strategies and or are not going to become a trade barrier. So it's important to note that a lot of this work that we do, we do it hand in hand, including with FDA. Um, and FDA also has foreign service officers overseas. And as Brianna mentioned, you don't necessarily need to have an agricultural background as far as like FAS goes. We have people with a legal background, economics, um, statisticians, uh, one of one guy is like spatial engineering. Um, so it's a you know, diverse background and, and we could definitely utilize people with, with all that. So um, there's more to FAS, but I can share the, the link with you since I know we still have a couple of questions to go. That would be wonderful, yes. Uh, so the next question I'd like to ask is, uh, based on a New York Times article that I read that stated two thirds of the USDA's budget is spent on nutrition and food insecurity programs. So how do these USDA policies support women and families both within your units and also agency-wise and perhaps even globally? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I know most of that budget is going to the Food and Nutrition Service. This is at one of the 29 agencies of USDA. Um, and before I was in FAS, I used to work in that agency with the SNAP program, the Supplemental mm -hmm. Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, and I think a, a great chunk of that budget goes to the SNAP, which uh, benefits households who, um, I mean, as, I don't know <laughs> how to explain this. I think a lot of you know about the SNAP program, but uh, benefits families uh, who are low income in America. Uh, and also within the, the FNS, we, we also, I mean, I shouldn't say we, cause I, I don't work there anymore. I, I don't wanna speak by, for, for my colleagues there, but this agency FNS also has the, the child nutrition programs, the school feeding programs, the school lunches and breakfast. I mean, I was one of those participants when I was in school. So all of those wonderful, the farm to school programs, I don't know if you guys are familiar with all of those amazing programs uh, that ultimately aim to promote food security domestically, but also um, to um, promote healthy eating in America. And uh, I, I, I don't know, again, if you guys are familiar with the farm to school program, but it is really uh, trying to connect farmers with the students at the very uh, school level, high school, primary school, where children can learn how to, to, to grow their own food and even how to cook those meals. Um, so this is the, the, the farm to school, but as, as you know, the SNAP program, uh, households are uh, depending on their uh, income, uh, depending on the number of families, the member of the family, uh, they're able to receive like an EBT car where they can purchase uh, foods mm -hmm. at farmers markets and supermarkets. Uh, mostly, uh, almost all, all types of food, but of course not all. And then we have the WIC program, which is for women uh, and infant uh, children where uh, women also have like a type of coupons where they can go to the supermarket and, and buy uh, specific foods for during her pregnancy and, and her lactating time. Uh, they also receive a nutrition education uh, um, uh, classes. 
to to learn how to better eat and and cook and etc for their child for them uh, and SNAP also offers this nutrition education uh, programs for people to learn how uh, to cook uh, meals that are healthy, accessible, uh, that are within your budget, et cetera. So that's, I'm just giving that overview of FNS. Uh, and I, I don't know if I should be doing this. I, I, I was not clear by that agency to talk on their behalf. But I mean, all of this can be found on their website. Um, the other thing uh, I will say about uh, FNS um, is the Dietary Guidelines for America, which is developed by scientists, by a, a committee of, of scientists, and uh, also they provide the recommendations. And these recommendations on the ultimate, the Dietary Guidelines are used to implement the nutrition program the, the, by the government. All, all that I just mentioned are, are coming from recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines. Um, and regarding, I think now a transition to FAS, um, well, I, I think my, my work or our work is to uh, promote U.S. agriculture, which includes uh, farmers, all type of farmers, female, I mean, women farmer, all minority farmers, all types of farmers uh, that, are, that are interested in exporting their products. Uh, and also uh, promoting uh, U.S. food that is very safe. When you go overseas, if you've ever been to another country, you know when you're purchasing U.S. food that you're buying safe food. Uh, and this is the type of food that we, we try to uh, make sure that uh, markets are open and that countries are following international standards uh, to make sure the world has safe, safe food. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and just to add to that, um, as she mentioned, you know, with FAS, uh, we work not only to safeguard the food that comes into our country, but also as it goes out. And so we want to make sure that the host countries are adopting science-based standards, which is where, you know, the, the policy and uh, trade negotiations come into play or, you know, just discussions. Um, but I'd also like to highlight one of the other activities that or other the programs under um, the Foreign Agricultural Service, which is the McGovern Dole program. Um, that's International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program. It helps support education, child development, food security, and low-income food deficit countries around the world. Um, and the program provides uh, the program provides for the donation of U.S. ag commodities, which is then um, sold and find that the money is used to provide technical assistance and support the school feeding and maternal and child nutrition projects. Um, these programs, of course, are focused on uh, schools um, and, and recently they're starting to focus a little bit more on young girls, but um, to the question of how, you know, our USDA policy areas affect women and families, I'd like to say that it actually, it affects all of us um, regardless because agriculture is part of our lives. You know, the food that we eat, the clothes that we're wearing, and even the fuel in our cars, if you take ethanol into consideration. So um, it is important that we pay attention at the full spectrum because ultimately, if the father can't make enough money off of the products that he sold, then his family won't have food on the table. Um, same thing with women, you know, um, if you're a single mom, you, you need to make sure that you have enough money. And we want to make sure that, um, at least here in the U.S., that the products are at, at a reasonable price. So if we have bad negotiations, say with like Mexico, at least I'm, I'm from Texas. So, you know, a lot of our produce comes from Mexico. And so if if we have a bad negotiation agreement or there's stalling or something. And so there's, you know, we don't get our limits or our other produce, which means that whatever we do have in country is actually going to go up in price. So um, that's kind of like the role that we play in FAS, making sure that the markets are open and things are flowing both in and out. Thank you, Yuna. That's very interesting. Um, I also have just a quick follow-up question on that. How has COVID affected operations, especially I heard you say something about uh, feeding school children? Um, so as far as, you know, as you know, here in the U.S., um, a lot of kids uh, depend on school, that, uh, on the school for lunches, breakfast, lunch, um, and sometimes even like midday snacks. Um, as you know, We've been working with farmers to get some of these products out there. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, a lot of the produce was going to waste because mm -hmm. we didn't have people in the fields where there was no way uh, to get this to the markets. And so through various organizations, you know, they, they've started to coordinate to even, you know, get volunteers to pick the, the stuff from the field and get it to the market. So mm -hmm. um, I, I can't speak to how it's worked internationally. I know that 
um, at least in the McGovern Dole programs, um, you know, the funding is still there. We have our implementing partners in country uh, that, that make this happen. Um, other countries have been, were a little slower, I should say, at, uh, at uh, you know, kind of getting everyone to stay home and, and all that. But um, I, I really couldn't give you full details on, on how this affected. But, you know, we can just assume that it was similar to here where a lot of people were, were left with trying to figure out how to feed their kids. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and um, and ask this question. So each of you is involved with either the Hispanic American cultural effort or woman in agriculture. So can you please explain to us what the role of these groups are and if you can explain any projects um, that you're currently working on within these organizations? Elizabeth, you want to go first? <laughs> Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so women in agriculture, this is, a, I think it's a little bit different from other uh, employee resource group because this one was, uh, this organization was developed or started by the administration during the Obama administration, the political appointees uh, asked for this organization to be developed. Uh, versus the other ones were more like bottom up approach where employees came together and created those organizations. So this uh, Women in Agriculture group is uh, ultimately the, the mission is to uh, foster development for women who work at the department and also highlight the contributions that we do to the department. Uh, and often or um, since I started doing the Obama administration, there was a lot of uh, support, of course, from leadership. Uh, and there were uh, senior officials, women who were on the board um, and some of the things that we do, uh, organizing mentoring programs, organizing networking opportunities, uh, again, highlighting uh, uh, women who are in high level positions or not just high level, but contributing to the mission of USDA. So for Women's History Month, which we are in now, uh, we are uh, highlighting specific women scientists more specifically who are contributing to the mission of uh, USDA and that we usually don't hear from. Again, we have over 100,000 employees uh, and we don't know much about what's going on in the regions in, in the state level. So highlighting those at the, at the department level, highlighting this women's contribution. So that's one thing. And the second one is organizing meetings for women who want to start their own chapters in other, uh, the, in other uh, regions or, or field offices who want to start the women in agricultural chapter. We might have other events at the end of this month to bring us all the members together, but we're trying to figure out how to do that with the uh, virtual platform. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so for ASE, which is a Hispanic, um, sorry, Hispanic associate, uh, I'm sorry, can you help me with this one, Elizabeth? I always get confused. <laughs> Hispanic American cultural effort. Yes, I always get associated. Um, so um, I actually joined, am I muted? It says I'm muted, there we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so in ASE, our mission is to promote personal and professional growth of the Hispanic community with, uh, within USDA. Um, ASE started back in 1972, more, more as a union for the Hispanic um, in working at USDA to talk about the working conditions um, and it's continued to, to thrive since then. It became officially an uh, employee resource group in 18, I'm sorry, 1974. Um, the vision is to be recognized as a leader organization for the professional development of Hispanics at USDA. And uh, we coordinate professional development as well as social events, cultural awareness uh, events, and um, we like to uh, have interagency collaboration, partner up with similar USG organizations such as like State Department, USAID, um, NASA, um, CBP, uh, just to, to coordinate events throughout the year. Uh, two of the main activities that USDA focus, I'm sorry, that ASE focus on is uh, working with um, HAKU to bring, um, uh, to promote internship opportunities within USDA. And I think um, some of the other members can probably speak to that. That's how they started um, at USDA. And I think Elizabeth was a HAKU intern, if I'm correct. So she could speak to that opportunity. Um, 
and we also work on promoting uh, the Hispanic uh, Heritage Month now. Uh, activities that we're working on specifically uh, for this month, um, we are going to have a, a Women in Politics Roundtable later this month, where we're having a representative from different agencies speak about their uh, experience at USDA and, um, you know, kind of promote women's empowerment. And we hope that this isn't just, uh, uh, you know, just a, a one-time thing. We're hoping that we can continue this through, throughout, you know, our mission and, and throughout the longevity of this organization. Um, I don't know, Virginia, if you want to speak to anything. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, fellow Panther here. So I'm so happy to see your faces. Um, really excited. And I just first wanted to give the opportunity to these three incredible ladies, because uh, really, they're just so knowledgeable. And I myself am constantly learning about the amazing work that USA, USDA does across, you know, all its multiple agencies. So I really wanted to give them the platform. They are SMEs. I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much. I want to just recognize them for a moment. Thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure the students appreciate it as well. So um, I um, do want to answer the question about, um, for example, like, Asif, I recently actually joined and I first joined uh, as a member uh, because anything that's related to Hispanic, I mean, when I moved from Miami, and if any of you decide to move from Miami and as you move on uh, to past FIU, uh, you may, any, any little niche that I could find um, anything about my culture or similar cultures, I was very excited about. So the fact that USDA provided that opportunity for me to just just be able to contact other people that um, were of similar backgrounds and just learning about them. And I know um, there's one event, which uh, it's the Thursday Spanish luncheon. So that, that's a really cool one that ASA is doing where, um, and I personally haven't been able to join because <laughs> I've been having meetings during that lunchtime. Um, but I actually am going to try to join this Thursday because it seems so great in the chat and how people are just sharing different dishes and books recommendations. And it's just that um, moment uh, out of your workday that you can take and, and be able to just have conversations with others. It's just really, really nice. And so that, that for me was, was really nice to see at USDA. And I, and I also wanted just to, to say one thing. Um, these are the, the ladies, for example, that are working and really executing on the prep programs that USDA has. Um, and so for me, I'm an HR specialist, as mentioned before. So though I don't necessarily have the knowledge that they do, but I help in my own agency uh, hire those like them, right? And so for me, um, any questions that, by the way, that you all may have on entering uh, internships, or entering um, federal government service via other hiring paths, please feel free to, to let me know. I'd be happy to share my knowledge with you, happy to put you in contact with others that know more than me. Um, so just wanted to put that in before I go any further, but being able to just say, you know, give my, my elevator pitch of, there was one administrator that we had in my agency. I'll say this really quick because it stuck with me. Um, he said, somebody had asked him, so what do you do for a living? Like, what, what do you do in USDA? And um, his, his was very short. And it was just like, I help feed the American people. And it's a very broad statement, right? How do you do that? I mean, there's so many ways. And just we just saw how, how they help support uh, access to healthy food, different programs. And so I encourage you to, to visit USDA.gov find out about the different agencies, the work that we're doing. Um, and again, if you have any questions related to USDA or any other department, I may not know the department's work, but I can at least um, put you into that uh, frame of mind of just finding out different internships or anything like that. I myself uh, started and moved up to DC because of a Haku internship. So I was, um, I had just finished uh, UM. I was going, uh, studying for my second master's at Boston virtually before any kind of pandemic here, but um, I was doing that online and um, I really just wanted to experience something else other than Miami. And uh, I found that maybe some of the things were limited there and I just wanted to expand and see what else was out there. And so Haku really 
was the way that I was able to make that jump. And from Haku, I went into the federal um, internship program, which is Pathways. So um, I also have familiarity as a Pathways internship graduate myself. I was converted. So um, I just wanted to go in there and put that plug in. But, uh, but yeah, so any questions that you may have, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer. Uh, and you or your friends, that's fine too. Uh, I'll go ahead and put my, my information in the chat so we all can talk later if you need. Great, thank you. So I actually have a question that is uh, basically for Virginia, since she works in HR. But uh, Elizabeth and Yannette, please feel free to answer uh, when we're finished, when she's finished. So um, how does a new administration's appointment of a different secretary of the USDA, the USDA in this case, Tom Vilsick, um, affect day-to-day -day operations in your department? So when there's an incoming um, POTUS and you know, they, they appoint different people, how do you adjust to that shift in personnel? So that's been uh, a very interesting thing about working in, in federal government. You know, you usually do have that change every four years and no matter the administration, uh, you're here for a mission. And so for us, it's really, um, I personally don't have any play um, for the politicals as we refer to them. So um, we have the, de the, the department HR, which is um, associated with just the department. And then I work for the um, business center, which services three different agencies within USDA. So for us, we do have political appointments out in the field. And so um, they're usually um, appointed by the president. And so we do have to work with that transition of onboarding them, training them. What information do they need to be successful on their first day? What resources do they need? Is it technology? Um, is it just Hey, this is what you're going to be doing. You know, you, you, you had, you were selected for this. This is how you can be, uh, take on the work and, and be successful. So um, it is interesting to do that. I personally actually work in the reporting and analytics. So I report out to our senior leadership, um, anything related to our workforce, what are diversity numbers? Uh, how many internships do we have? You know, how many interns are we reaching our hiring goals? Uh, you know, what percentage of our workforce is African American, uh, Native American, uh, and how can we better improve? And we're always constantly looking to improve across the board. And sometimes it, it presents challenges, um, but I do think that the agencies, for example, and I'll just speak from mine, um, I know I don't uh, service uh, APHIS or FAS, but for us, I know that we have seven different programs uh, for internships, one of which is HAKU, and we actually have a hiring goal, like how many HAKU interns can we get this uh, fiscal year? And we do promote these programs to our hiring managers and say, hey, this is not just, you know, um, the only way for, for you to obtain um, additional support. So there's uh, seven about those, but then with hiring paths to federal service, there's about 12 different ones. Um, you know, whether you're a veteran, uh, Peace Corps, Native American, students and recent graduates. I know Brianna had talked about that as well. So um, just individuals with disability as well. So um, there are a lot of pathways to federal service. And one thing that she had mentioned, which I really appreciated was the fact that you don't need to come from, have a specific degree. Um, I know for the, the agency I service, we have um, geospatial specialists, uh, you know, who go on and take uh, videos and just of, of our different lands and just keep track of that. We have real estate specialists as well. So if you know about real estate, that's another thing. We have CPAs, lawyers. Um, it's really interesting. Um, whatever you can think of, trust me, there's probably a job for it. So um, not just at USDA, but abroad. So um, yeah, that's kind of uh, the overview about uh, hiring. But um, as it relates to politicals, uh, we are just kind of used to it, I think. And um, we always look forward to, to servicing them and just getting them on board and saying, hey, this is what you need. Uh, and we're here to support you in case you have any questions uh, moving forward. Yeah, I have to add, at least for FAS, um, we just, you know, we know that there's going to be a transition period and, and we just work to uh, put together like a briefing binder uh, of, to familiarize them with the work that 
we're working on and, you know, maybe a specific area that they're going to be handling. So. So I think I'm going to open up to the participants. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll go down the list. It looks like Brittany. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Brittany. I'm a junior double majoring in public policy and linguistics at FIU. And my question is for anyone who wants to answer. So as a functioning federal agency, you guys have mentioned how interconnected your work is with other organizations like nonprofits, other federal agencies, the private sector. And I was wondering, do you ever find this complexity to hinder like your initiatives or what you're trying to push forward and achieve throughout the year? Um, I can speak on the trade policy. I think that is the richness of the work we do because our mission is to serve the American public. We are paid by your taxes. Actually, thank you guys for paying <laughs> your taxes. I mean, be because we are serving the American public, they are part of the American public, the NGOs, the industry, the farmers. So, the, I mean, at least with when we are framing the US government position on how should we respond on coffee exports to Panama, we want to know what, what are people saying domestically? What is our industry saying? What are our farmers saying? What is academia saying? So that we can better frame the US government position when we talk to a government of Panama. So it is the richness of that, at least this is how I see it, that help us frame the, the USG position. Yeah, I have to add, um, one of my current programs is actually an interagency partnership with USAID and FDA. And although the three of us are USG, um, we have different missions. So when we're trying to coordinate and prioritize activities, you know, finding that balance, and, and yes, it is a challenge, um, but I feel like I've learned so much and, and being able to to speak to the different languages, you know, a FDA has their priority where it's, you know, USG consumers, making sure that it's benefit to USG consumers for us is, you know, USG farmers and market access in and out. Um, USAID is more of like the development aspect. So how do you speak to all that in learning that language um, is, is actually, I see it as a benefit. Um, it is challenging sometimes. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I feel like we're speaking this, we're saying the same thing, just saying it in a different way. And technically like, a connects with B and B connects with C and, and all our missions are there. We just got to see it. And you just got to make those connections for them in order to um, keep progress and, and, and all that. So it, it is challenging, but I enjoy it. Good. And next up, Nikki is going to join the conversation. Hi, um, my question, I guess it can be for anyone, but kind of geared more or less to Elizabeth. So when you were referring to like the framing and wanting to know what we're saying domestically before you even present outside of us, um, how has COVID pandemic impacted those dynamics? I know that's not something that we can necessarily prepare for yet. We kind of, not that specifically. I know there are things in place for emergencies and things like that, but no one expected this and we're still dealing with it. So how do you see from the beginning and us transitioning, how have that impacted the framing for everything? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, and, and you have some of the answer. I think we are still trying to figure it out. Uh, it is, a, it is a challenge uh, what, how we are responding because a lot of some countries when we, the pandemic started closed their market as a protection, right? And also because limited food production. I mean, so, and it is it is okay in this case, I think, I'm, I don't know, please don't quote me on this, in those instances to put those trade barriers. But our job is to open markets. So how do we respond uh, on that? So we had to be, and we are still like, depending on the level of the country, the income of the country, trying to be very uh, understanding and diplomatic and, and listening to their uh, view at least um, to make sure that it is okay, but also working with the country. Okay, by when are we gonna start opening the, the market so that we can start 
uh, shipping there, looking at the importance of food in this critical moment, that is also not by closing your borders that uh, you're gonna have food security. So I think we, yeah, I think it, it is a great question. We're still learning, especially when we also engage at multilateral uh, op, uh, offices, multilateral organizations. Uh, there is a lot of discussion now on the food systems uh, and this has helped us domestically too, to understand the importance of having a strong food system. Uh, that it is important also to have uh, locally produce, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't wanna, please don't quote me on, this is not USG position, but it is showing us and the world is seeing the importance of seeing a strong uh, food systems. Uh, and so the US is also kind of framing the, the position based on learning. So I, I, I don't have a clear answer. I think it's bringing us a lot of learning even for us uh, in the US government. And thanks for, for USG. <laughs> You go, US government. Thank you. Yeah, I just ask that because I know integrity is very important and because of security. So I didn't know how much it impacted us as United States, but you know, other countries' integrity because of the importing, exporting, like you say, opening up. I know like everyone is like on high alert and like kind of like looking over their shoulders at each other. So um, that was, you know, as, as we go to heal or, or restructure and try to prevent something like this again or prepare because this was a lesson as well. I just didn't know, you know, how was it transitioning or what was like the projective of how to transition from where we are now. Yes, great. Thank you, Nikki. It's a, it's a great question. And I think it's more for us to learn. I, I don't think we, at least in FAS, we're still learning and, and figuring this out. Yeah, I think one of the also important things to note is, um, you know, because of COVID, it, it wasn't necessarily that the food was bad, that it may have been contaminated. It's more of like the human aspect of the human capacity where we had to minimize the number of people at the at the borders doing the inspection. So that meant that a lot of ships were not being inspected and, and being held both in other countries as well as here in the US. So recognizing like, okay, how can we improve that in the future? And like Elizabeth mentioned, um, you know, looking at, at our food systems, like how dependent are we on foreign you know, products as well as, you know, I don't know if you guys notice this, and this is just my personal opinion and my view and, and my observation, um, you know, around here, I went to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's that tends to buy more local source stuff. I was like, they were actually stocked, stocked more than uh, like Giant or some of the other grocery stores. And I was like, that actually made sense. But then eventually they kind of, you know, when people realize like, oh, Trader Joe's is full, um, then they realize like, okay, then they also ran out. But it does, I think it's just, and, and not just for the US, but I think just around the world, everyone will start recognizing the gaps that they have in their systems. Okay, it looks like we're winding down. So I'd like to thank everyone who participated in the session and especially Virginia, Yannette, Elizabeth and Brianna for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you to all four of them. Let's also thank and and uh, and round of applause, Maureen, for a fantastic expert moderating of, of this session. Thank you, Maureen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, this has certainly been one of the most uh, information uh, packed and inspiring three hours of a uh, Zoom that I think has occurred worldwide uh, since um, since people started using Zoom. Uh, so I, I express my gratitude to. To everyone, including all the students who asked great questions, to our USDA team, to my friend uh, Virginia, and uh, our, our, our group has about exactly one hour before we need to be back on here for a, a very interesting session about congressional spouses. Uh, and, and so please uh, make sure on the topic of USDA that uh, you uh, partake in nutrition over the next hour. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking if we want to share our contact info, what is the best way the panel is? Maybe through your email, Eric, or what? Uh, yeah, anything you want to drop in the chat before uh, people log off if you want to quickly or get it uh, to me. I don't know. Uh, I'm Eric F at FIU.edu or, or via Virginia, uh, since she's regularly in touch with me. I can make sure uh, to get that out and, and sincerely appreciate uh, you being willing to connect with our students. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.